Okay, so since this is our last day, I feel uh, that I must start by, uh, by saying a few things. And uh, since it was a mere 10 days ago when, uh, when it was a couple of hours after I landed and I was here and we were all uh, eager and bright and uh, fresh and uh, now 10 days later and, uh, and it's almost all over. And it always reminds me of a conference. When the conference, if you're the first speaker, it's always uh, an exciting thing. Everybody just got there, and you're the first speaker, and you speak, and everyone is into it. And then the last speaker, especially in conferences, the room is half empty because uh, half of the people are already gone. And then in the back, there's always the luggage of those people who are going to leave right after the conference, and some of them leave in the middle of the speech. And as the person talks, slowly people get up and grab their luggage and slink out. And he ends up talking, and there are two people in a kind of a dark hall, and it's a kind of a sad, uh, a sad atmosphere. So here I got the chance to be both, be the, uh, the speaker in the beginning when everyone is eager, and at the end where people are all going to be walking off. But I must, uh, I must really thank uh, Neil for uh, unbelievable hospitality, because um, I really I felt so much at home. And so... Uh, so that's the opportunity I want to take. Um, I told you the joke about the, the goat, but uh, you pro and you said, no, no, not a goat. But, uh, so in fact, the, um, so in the Jewish uh, religion, people used to go three times a year to Jerusalem. It was called uh, uh, going up for the holidays. So there were three big holidays, and for each of these holidays, they would go up. Two of them were actually seven-day holidays, so they would be in Jerusalem for seven days, and um, and then each one would go back to their homes. And the uh, the day after the holiday, traditionally, is called Isru Chag, which means like the holiday tied up. So what does it mean, the holiday tied up? And there was something else that was done in that day. They, they used to take out the uh, table with the bread from the temple and show it to all the people. Now, the uh, idea of the bread, in the temple there was a big table with 12 big loaves of bread. They were baked once a week, and uh, at the end of the week they would be distributed to the priests, and the fresh ones that were baked would be put on the table for the week. But the thing is, though, there was a family of bakers who who uh, had some secret way of baking these things, that, uh, that the bread, even after a week, was as fresh as the moment that it was baked. And, uh, and there's even a funny story in the Talmud about once the, these, this family of bakers actually hiked the price. So uh, the priest decided, no, we're not going to pay them. Uh, so they went to Egypt. That was the... Uh, the America of those days, and they got the best bakers in Egypt to come and do it, and they didn't manage, because by the end of the week, there was a difference in the taste. So they had to go back to this family and pay them whatever they wanted in order to get the good fresh bread. But why did they take that bread out on that last day, and why is it called the, the tying of the holiday? So the Talmud says that the reason is that God is saying, you came to visit me here for seven days, and first of all, they take out the bread and to tell them, look, it's not like sometimes a guest comes and you're happy to see them, but uh, if they stay for a long time, you say, okay, go away already. I mean, uh, your uh, taste changed <laughs> in these seven days. So they took out the bread to say, no, God is saying your taste does not change. It's like this bread. It's the, it's the same now as when you came, and I'm as excited now to have you as, as I was when you came. And the day is called the tying of the holiday because God is saying, I wish I could tie the holiday so it wouldn't go away and so that you could stay even longer. So that would be the, uh, uh, the uh, epitome of, uh, of hospitality is to try to say that uh, your taste hasn't changed and really I wish you could stay longer and everything like that. So I, uh, I can't speak for how Neil feels but I know that at least I feel that she says, no, no, your taste hasn't changed, and I don't mind if you stayed longer. So I really have to thank you for that. It's, it's very nice. Okay, so <laughs> let's get, now that I have said my thank yous, 
while people are still here and didn't walk off before the end of the conference. Uh, so let's get back to where we were. So remember, we have a, uh, we have a range and we want the largest LCP in that range. And we saw some very nice ideas, but they were all dependent on the range size. And we were looking for some idea that was independent uh, of the range size. And, the, and this idea, we said, was the idea of the bridges, when, where what we want to do is the following. We're going to define a bridge as, uh, as two indices where the LCP is their height, the height of the bridge. And so uh, our idea was the following. If that's how you define bridges, then clearly a lot of them are superfluous. They're not going to help you in the range LCP. So in the range LCP, we said the only thing that help us are the optimal bridges. And we had an example here. So uh, this bridge is not optimal. It doesn't do you any good because if you are, if you are here, you have something taller. And uh, anywhere where this bridge is, there is a taller bridge than it. And therefore, we don't need it. Uh, this one, although it's lower than this, is an optimal bridge, and it should be here because if this is the range that we're looking at, then this is the LCP, not this. And if this is the range that we're looking, then obviously this is the LCP. So uh, our idea is to get rid of the bridges that are not optimal and only remain with the optimal bridges. Now, if the number of optimal bridges is small enough, and in our case, uh, we said it's, it's O of n log n, but assuming that the number of bridges is, uh, is b, then we, use, then we uh, write them down on a two-dimensional plane, these bridges, and then whenever we want a range, the range is just an orthogonal query in the two-dimensional plane, and any element that is in, within the, that range of the orthogonal query is a uh, potential. What we want is the tallest one, so the maximum height of the bridge that is there in that area. And the, um, uh, the geometers know how to do it well with time O of B log B pre-processing. Pre and I believe I, uh, I uh, scoured through the net last night that they can actually do it in O of log log B nowadays in, uh, for, uh, uh, for the query. So yeah, you see from yesterday to today, the algorithm is faster. <laughs> but <laughs> ignorance is bliss. But uh, so the only question that remained for us was to show how many uh, such bridges there really are. So what we're going to, let me give you a bit the intuition because I looked at these uh, slides last night and I thought that some intuition here would help. So the intuition would be the following. We're basically going to go on a suffix tree and we're going to go from the bottom of the suffix tree up and collect optimal bridges as we go up. So that's the idea that we're going to, to, to be doing. And uh, so what is, so if you're looking at a suffix tree, and you're like at a very low place, and you're looking at, maybe there's uh, another one here, and you're looking at uh, this particular LCP, uh, obviously all of these guys are going to define a bridge, but they're going to define uh, not the bridge, but this kind of arch that we said. Okay, so if it has many children, each one of them is going to define a bridge of the same height. However, we pointed out that if there's four of them, one, two, three, four, we don't really need all of these bridges as well, which is going to be a lot, a quadratic number of bridges in some sense. But we can only look, but it's enough for us to look at the linear number of bridges, which is this one. So we have one, two, three, four. So we have this kind of an aqueduct type thing rather than a bridge because these are optimal 
relative to all the others. So this particular bridge, this one, is not an optimal bridge and it's not relevant. We don't need it since we have both this and that. So no matter what range has it, we'll have something else. Equally, we don't need this bridge here. So there is a bunch of bridges we don't need and therefore it, we just have to keep a um, we just have to keep a list of these bridges. Now each one of the lowest nodes is going to give such a list. And in some sense, these LCPs are maximal, in the sense that you can't go any lower and still have uh, something that this LCP is part of. So that's the, okay, so I mean, if you have something here, then there is this LCP, but it's not as big as this. It's a uh, prefix of the other LCP. So it's not maximal in this sense. So our idea is going to be to take all of these lists of the maximal LCPs that we get, and as we go up the tree, we're going to merge them and get, uh, and get more and more aqueducts, but the aqueducts are now going to be, because if you merge two lists like that and one of them is taller, then you're going to get something like that. At this point, because they're interleaved, you'll have to keep both of them, because Maybe, uh, maybe this is your range and then this is taller. And maybe this is your range and then this is taller. So whenever you have two aqueducts that you merge, you really have the lists going this way. So what we're going to be doing, and that's the idea of the algorithm, is to take these aqueducts and as we go up, we merge all of them. And the only question is going to be how many how many bridges do we end up with when we merge all of them and how much work? Now, we're, when we start out, obviously when we start out with these aqueducts in the bottom, there's O of n bridges at most because no, no two bridges start at the same point. So there's O of n bridges. But as we merge them, we keep increasing the number of bridges. So the question is how bad is this blow up? Now, if you remember union find, this blow up is we're going to add the smaller to the bigger, so the number of times that you actually need to add the bridge is going to be log of the bridge, and therefore we're going to end up with n log n bridges. So uh, that's the general idea of the proof of why, in fact, the number of bridges that we have is, uh, is n log n. It actually, it actually also shows why... Um, why the work is going to be not so bad because we're going to go up on the suffix tree and as we go down from, as we go up from the sides we're going to be adding the bridges from the small to the big as we go up so if you have n log n things and you have to go up on a suffix tree and always add so you never grow up more than twice we'll get a time n log squared n the time however uh, what I'm not going to show you is that there is a paper by Apostolico and Preparata that does exactly this and they managed to do it smartly that the, since the total number of bridges is O of n log n then they can actually do the whole thing in time O of n log n rather than n squared log n uh, than n log squared n but, uh, but that log squared is already less uh, important to me the idea, the main idea that I wanted to show here was that uh, um, when you think of, uh, of a problem, the traditional or incremental way would be to say, okay, what are the powerful tools that I have in order to solve the problem? And we saw uh, last time in what was a major uh, example, uh, this, this problem ended up being a major example for using a lot of stuff like periodicity and range uh, minimum queries and all kinds of stuff that we had seen before and suffix arrays and so we saw all of that and we still didn't get as good a uh, result as we wanted and what we're looking here is okay so sometimes view your problem differently define it differently uh, have some new idea and at that point this is not really something that we had done before uh, although we use the suffix trees for counting and although we use um, 
uh, rectangular range queries from geometry. So yes, uh, this is not everything uh, invented from scratch, but it is not the pattern matching ideas that we had done before used as black boxes. So you needed to think and make some fresh, uh, fresh ideas. So let's quickly run through this and go on to the to indexing. Um, so uh, there's actually a running example here of the idea that I told you of taking these aqueducts from the leaves of the suffix tree and moving them up. So in this example, if we look at this uh, string, then A, B, C, B, C, C, and D are uh, maximal common prefixes. I mean, these are prefixes that, I think there's even a picture. No, there isn't a picture. Oh, well. I thought there was. OK. So A, B, C, B, C, C, and D are maximal common prefixes in the sense that they are not prefixes of anything else, of any other uh, suffix. Because if you look at A, B, C, there is A, B, C, and A, B, C. But this one has A, B, C, A, and this one has A, B, C, D after it. Now, on the other hand, A, B is also a prefix. So you have AB here, AB here, and AB here. But AB is a prefix of ABC, and ABC already is a suffix, which means that AB would be somewhere here. So if this is A, you'd have ABC. So you have the ABCs here, but the AB goes down here. So it's actually higher. Now, it may be that the AB itself had a couple of, would be an aqueduct, and so at some point, we would need to take care of it when we merge, as we go up. But uh, for this example, let's look at the bottom now. So these are the maximum common prefixes. And we construct aqueducts for these MCPs. And the A, B, and the B are not, since uh, A, B is a prefix of A, B, C, and B is a prefix of B, C. So A, B, and B, although they are common prefixes, but they're not maximal. So if you're looking at the very bottom where you start up growing your, uh, your list of uh, optimal um, bridges, then, um, then that's what you're going to start out. So for every MCP, you construct the set of its optimal bridges in ascending order of indices because as we showed yesterday, you don't need to look at all of the pairs, but really, this is a string. It's a, it's an increasing string of uh, suffixes. And that's enough to actually give us the optimal bridges of the MCP. So you're seeing here the way that we are sparsifying the number of bridges by the optimality uh, condition that's important to us. Now, it could be that there are indices left without a set at this point. Uh, we're going to call them a pillar rather than that for the sake of the uh, explanation here. We're going to call them a pillar because a pillar is like a bridge that has nowhere to go, no other side. It's just one, one leg of the bridge. Uh, so uh, if we look at this, then that's what we have. So the ABC is going to give us this bridge. The uh, BC is going to give us this bridge. The C is going to give us this bridge. And all of these are maximal in the sense that they're not prefixes of anything else. The, uh, the D also. The D also gives us a maximal. Then the AB doesn't give us a bridge because it's not maximal. But in that sense, so we just draw it as a pillar, how far up it goes. Uh, it goes all the way as up as it can, but uh, that's, that's what uh, these pillars are. So we start out, we look at it that way. And now we are interleaving them. So as we go up, we're going to be interleaving sets of maximal um, sets of maximal, uh, that would be kind of a recursion. So we're going up the tree, and we'll take the set of maximal common prefixes and put them together. And putting them together means interleaving them. Again, because of the optimality condition. Anything that's completely outside or inside one is not optimal anymore. So we're, and since we're going from the tallest down, so obviously, what we need to do is just interleave. And uh, because we're interleaving the small into the big, we're not going to add 
more bridges than the size of the smaller set of the smaller aqueduct that's interleaved. And so the picture, so that's the recursive step. So if we take these two and we want to interleave them, this is what is added. So we're adding one bridge, which is the size of the smaller set, which is that, that pillar in that case. And then we want to interleave these. So we add this, uh, we add this bridge, and then we interleave those. So at the end, after all the interleaving, the colored, the different colors are the different bridges that we have. But as you can see, we are bounded by the number of the MCPs that we started out from times log because of the uh, additions. So the count is, as we said, the base case is really a partition of the indices. So it's O of n. Every recursion is a union. In union find, we only count the time. Here we count also the number of bridges that we add, but it's the same kind of count. So it's the, we add the size of the intersection, and so we're going to charge the addition to the smaller set, as we do in your find. At the end, we end up with no more than O of n log n additions. Now, the entire process, again, we can do it on the suffix tree starting from the nodes, but that would give us time O of log squared n if we do it in the stupid way. In the paper of Apostolico and Preparata from 83, it can be done in time O of n log n. So that kind of uh, uh, wraps up the uh, situation with the LCP of the, um, of the range. Now, with these bridges, so we're talking about open problems. Now, the bridges uh, are only good within an interval. So in fact, some of the algorithms that we saw before would be good for two intervals as well, but the bridge is not. Because if you have a bridge on one interval and another, all this interleaving kind of thing and optimal bridges that we have doesn't exactly work. So there is still an open problem of uh, range LCP where the ranges are separate, where it's not the largest LCP within the range. So this is not an exercise that I say uh, do and let's talk about it tomorrow. First of all, because I'm not going to be here tomorrow. Uh, but there is, uh, but the other reason is because this is like a master's thesis kind of exercise, so uh, so we don't talk about it tomorrow. So my my friend Gadi Landa once told me that uh, the emperor Napoleon uh, Bonaparte uh, he had this rule that whenever he conquered the city, he wanted all the bells of the town to ring in honor of his uh, of his victory when he marches into town. So they conquer some town, and he marches in, and silence. So he calls the elders of the town, and he says, I would like to know why you didn't ring the bells for me to uh, when I uh, marched into town. So they said, well, our dear emperor, we have ten good reasons why we didn't ring the bell. Reason number one, we don't have any bells in this town. So he says, fine. You do, I don't need to hear the other nine. This reason is sufficient. So I said, as far as this exercise, I'm not saying do it tomorrow because reason number one, I'm not here tomorrow. <laughs> That's sufficient. <laughs> okay. So we're moving back to indexing. So the digression that we had to suffix trees and LCPs was we wanted to see how these tools work in various ways. But of course, the, suffix, the, uh, the entire idea of suffix tree or suffix array came because we wanted to index so that when we take the text, we can in kind of linear time preprocess it. And then when you come with a uh, pattern, you can find all the occurrences of the pattern in time, that is uh, O of the pattern size plus TOCC. So that's indexing in its generality. And we are closing here a, uh, another cycle today, not just the cycle that I came in the 10 days ago, but also because, in fact, this uh, talk was the one that uh, I gave at uh, Rangoli of Algorithms in uh, Chennai a few months ago, and that's where I met Professor Mishra and the 
as it says in uh, Casablanca, that was the start of a beautiful friendship. So uh, that's what led also to this, uh, to this course. So we are finishing with that talk that uh, started it all, although there is a difference between this and that. First of all, I took out a lot of stuff that I gave there, uh, tastes and quick explanations, but since you are experts and you know it, so you don't need this because you saw the stuff in uh, great detail. And the second thing is I'm adding here things that uh, you appreciate because of your vast knowledge of the area and the people there in the conference did not, who did not have such a vast knowledge were, uh, uh, there wasn't enough time to actually get into it and uh, explain all of it. So I started out there by telling people that uh, this, that my first time in India, I came in actually without a visa, and that's a picture of me uh, on the first time in India. This is the uh, synagogue in uh, um, the Magen David synagogue in Baikala in, uh, in Mumbai. So that's where uh, my uh, Brit was when I was born. So that was my first time in India. And the reason I felt impelled to put these pictures is that uh, um, then... Uh, Hersberg, uh, no, Dan Gusfield, uh, spoke before me, and he was bragging to everyone that, ah, I've been to India the first time 40 years ago already, and uh, I'm an old-timer in India, and that kind of thing. So I told him, Dan, be quiet. My first time in India was 60 years ago, way before you, so forget it. In fact, my suspicion is that I was in India before any of you were in India, here in this room, so there. <laughs> we have established now some seniority here. So let's go on. So I explained to them what is indexing. So in Shakespeare, India is mentioned. It, there's this uh, statement from Shakespeare. Have all his ventures failed? What? Not one hit? From Tripoli, from Mexico and England, from Lisbon, Barbary and India? So where in Shakespeare does it say that? And so that's where indexing comes in. You, uh, you look for it. So the old solution was concordances. And concordances, the earliest concordance that's known was a concordance for the Bible from 1230. A concordance is a book where kind of an index. When we call indexing, this is where it comes from. A concordance is a book that has all the words of the book that I am indexing, but the words are lexicographically sorted. So it's hard to get the, um, it's, hard to <laughs> it's hard to get the uh, picture of the, uh, the storyline from reading the concordance, even though all the words are there, but uh, they're sorted. And so it's easy to find the word, and uh, the word has pointers to where it appears in the original text. So this is really, in some sense, exactly what we saw that the, uh, that, the, um, uh, that our suffix tree does, is uh, you look for your word, except we look for it in a tree, like rather than in a, a sorted uh, list, because we don't really have a list of words, but, but the idea is this, you find the word and then you have the pointer to where you are. Now, the modern solutions is that you can actually look for it, you put it, you enter that thing, that you're looking for, that entire sentence. You enter it, let's say, in your favorite search. You, for example, you put it in Google, and then it comes out and tells you, OK, this came from the Merchant of Venice, or Act 3. So OK, we, we now found out exactly where uh, India was mentioned in Shakespeare. So the idea was that you have a list of these words, like the concordance. And you look for the word Barbary, you look for the word India, you look for an intersection of where they appear, and where you have an intersection, that would be uh, the sentence that you're looking for. But that assumes words, and like we said, we don't assume words. So if you're looking for a gene in the chromosome, then you don't have a word. What's the beginning and what's the end? Which is why we did not say... This is what I told you uh, when I uh, started the indexing. In information retrieval, that is what they do. You have words, and therefore, 
you reference the words and that's what you do. In our case, well, you don't reference the words because there are no words. You're looking for some substring in a string. There's no entrance and no end. So you would really need a, a, a dictionary, your, or your index, your concordance, would be a size o, o of n squared, a quadratic size. You don't want the concordance to be that big, which is why uh, we came up with the suffix tree. Now, there are these other two examples that I told you about. That is the find face that you can find. Find anybody in vk.com. I mean, this scares me so much every time that I see it. You see someone in the street, you take their picture, you get right away their address and what is their favorite uh, uh, dish and uh, what do they like and what do they hate and et cetera, et cetera. But address and telephone. So for you ladies out there, if you see a nice boy, click and you have all this information. Um, how do they do it? Or sounds, okay? So I don't know if I told you that, but there are a bunch of, SoundHound is one example, but there are a bunch of uh, uh, applications where if you're looking for a melody that you don't remember, you can find, uh, you can find the song by, uh, by playing it to uh, SoundHound. So the idea is, my daughters always complain that sometimes there's a melody stuck in their head. You wake up in the morning and there's this melody playing and it's playing in your head and you can't get rid of it until you get some other melody to stuck in, in instead of it or something. But sometimes you remember a melody or you hear a melody and you say, I know that song, but where did it come from? So, okay, so in some sense there is a search and that you need to index the songs in the way that if you take your uh, cell phone and you sing the song and assuming that you're not totally tone deaf, because then you, who knows what you get, but uh, assuming that you kind of uh, can carry a tune, then uh, it's going to tell you uh, what song it was. And how do they do it? So uh, what, what we saw is that suffix trees solve the first kind of question, the, the point when you don't have uh, beginning and end of the word, so suffix trees would do that. So we can construct um, the suffixes of, all, of the string, we do the suffix tree, we contract it, and at that point, uh, since we know that the number of internal nodes is the number of leaves, here's our famous friend uh, Peter Wiener, and we know how to construct uh, the suffix tree in linear time, and everything is good. What I failed to tell you is that following Wiener, there was a whole lot of people who, uh, who had suffix tree construction algorithms. So Peter McRae was one of them, and he actually uses a bit less space because he doesn't entirely need all the suffix links that... Uh, I mean, when you're saying less space, we're now not talking theoretician because the theoretician says, okay, he does it in linear time, I'm happy. But... Uh, some people say that the suffix tree in its best kind of uh, um, uh, implementation would still use almost 10 times the uh, space of the words that it's starting from because of all the links and everything else. So that's a lot. McRate has a smaller constant, but he's not online. So McRate actually needs to see the entire suffix from the beginning. Ukonen, but he starts from the beginning rather than the end. So in some sense, if you remember, Wiener puts in the suffixes from the ba back to the beginning and McCrate puts them in the first suffix, then the second, then the third, then the fourth. And so because he starts from the longest to the uh, shortest, that's why he's not online because you need the longest to start with. So Ukonen also starts from the beginning, but he manages to say, well, yes, I start from the first one, but even if I don't have the first one all the way to the end, I somehow have some sort of a star indicating I'm not done with it, and he has an online construction that starts from the beginning rather than uh, from the end, like Wiener. Um, Kosaraju had a, uh, an algorithm that was quasi-real-time in the sense that you can, uh, put, you can do a constant amount of work per symbol 
and yet um, you can do a constant amount of work per symbol and yet you can do indexing for whatever you have at any point. So it's uh, linear time, but it's not am amortized linear time. On the other hand, it's not real time. Why is it quasi real time? Because here is what uh, Kosaraggio's algorithm does. So he constructs the suffix tree really, but he constructs it um, in a way where it doesn't, he doesn't stabilize everything from the beginning. But rather, whenever you add something, things are stable here, then here, then here, then here. So the point is that once I added the letter, if I am looking for a pattern, so I added, let's say, A, which I didn't have before, and I'm looking for A, B, C, D, E. So adding the A that I didn't have before uh, may not already fix the entire, although in the, if I didn't have it before, it fixes. So maybe I did have it before. But I'm looking for A, B, C, D, E, which I didn't have before. So adding the A already does not mean that the suffix tree is uh, correct and full for me to find the A, B, C, D, E of the pattern. However, the A is there. Why? Because he says, if you're talking about real time, then the pattern also comes in in real time. So, uh, so if I added the A to the text, at that point you'll come up with the pattern and say, look for the A, B, C, D, E. But, well, you start by saying, look for the A. And I added the A. Then you say, and after the A, I want to see a B. And all this is in real time, because it's like one step of the clock, one, one, one tick of the clock. So that's what real time means, a constant time between one and the other. So you get the second pattern symbol. Now, at this point, the two top levels of the tree are stabilized. Things here are still a mess as far as A is concerned, but as far as the A is concerned, the top two are stabilized, so you can find the AB. Now here, it's, a, it's still a mess, but by the time you come with the C, it's the third tick, and at that point, this is stabilized as far as the A is concerned, and so on. So when you get to the end of the pattern, uh, the entire top of the tree up to A, B, C, D, E is stable. So you finished getting the pattern, and you can say, here it is. So this is why it's called quasi-real time in the sense the suffix tree is not constructed in real time. But you can index in real time, assuming, of course, that... Uh, the pattern also comes in in real time. So it's actually quite a clever idea. So that was that algorithm. Then Martin Farage came with an algorithm that is actually um, good enough. To, uh, he was my first PhD student. But uh, this algorithm came afterwards. Uh, that was not part of his dissertation. So the idea is that uh, what happens, so we know that in, for constant alphabet, um, Wiener's algorithm, McRae, Dukan, and all these guys, they actually work in time uh, O of n. Those that work amortized, amortized, and those that are quasi real time, quasi real time, whatever, but it's O of, uh, uh, o of n for fixed finite alphabets. But what happens if your alphabet is 1 through n? It's not a fixed finite alphabet, but at least for sorting and for parameterized matching, as we saw, and for a whole lot of things in the world, if your alphabet is not fixed finite but 1 through n, you can still do things faster than if your alphabet is totally uh, infinite or, with, or unlimited. So... These algorithms couldn't do it, but his algorithm can actually work in uh, O of n time also for uh, alphabet 1 through n. So that was his advantage. Uh, Igor Nor made an improvement on the um, on Kosovaggio's algorithm, was also a PhD student of mine, um, made an improvement on uh, uh, Kosovaggio's algorithm for real time. And there was a whole bunch of other things uh, out there, algorithms that can construct it in uh, 
um, in parallel and algorithms that uh, um, that can construct it not in real time but in time log n per symbol. So there is really the suffix tree being such a uh, such a powerful tool um, attracted a lot of work, and there are many nice algorithms with many nice ideas that construct the suffix tree. Okay, but from the whole thing we can conclude the following. So we, we have ourselves a definition. We say that a problem can be indexed efficiently if its time and space are the following. For pre-processing we can do it in time O tilde n and the query in O tilde n. Now the O tilde means that we hide so o, big O means that you hide uh, constants in here, so I don't care about constants. The O tilde means that you hide uh, polylogs here, and you don't care about the polylogs. And uh, I learned that uh, in some areas you also have O star, right, where you hide polynomials. But in this case, it would have been O star of 1. So uh, it's not, uh, <laughs> so it's a bit less interesting in our context. But in our context, Polynomials are still fairly uh, massive, so, uh, but logs, okay. We're willing to uh, sweep some logs under the rugs. So the, so the point is this. You have your text, pre-process it. If you need logarithms, I'll throw it in, but by and large, I want you to be linear times polylog for your pre-processing and also for the space. Although again, obviously linear space is a lot better, but log is not a huge thing. Quadratic is horrible. So you really, uh, the old star here would be totally defeating the purpose when you're talking about space, but, uh, but with logs, uh, okay, We're, we'll manage it somehow. For the query, for sure, the log is not a problem. And here, perhaps even the star would not be a problem because your queries are always shorter. And so, uh, and we're going to make some mention of that, of what happens if we actually indeed allow the queries to be more than linear or m poly log n. But, uh, but from a purest theoretical point of view, so we're going to say that the problem can be indexed efficiently. Inherently, the problem is inherently efficiently indexable if you can pre-process it in time and space O prime uh, o, o tilde of uh, n and query in time O tilde of n. So again, as we have said always before, n is the size of the text, m is the size of the pattern. Okay, so how do they index music and... Uh, and faces like we saw before. Okay, so for that, they actually do a, uh, they don't, so you're saying, okay, maybe that's sufficiently indexable. No, it's not, because what they use is filtration. In some sense, like the idea of Uzi Vishkin, except he proved that for non-periodic patterns, you can always sample and guarantee yourself something uh, that is small. But what they're saying is, that you can sample, um, that you can create some sort of sample for the music or for the faces or whatever. You can create some sort of sample that just in your data is such that uh, it kind of um, partitions the space into more or less equally big subspaces and allows you to narrow down on a small subspace where even if you do where you do, in fact, but uh, in order, you, you actually do an exhaustive search, but that's okay, because even if you do your exhaustive search, you're still going to be all right, uh, because, the, uh, because that set that remained isn't so large. And what we are looking for when we're saying that we want something to be efficiently indexable, we want something that is independent of the... Uh, uh, um, that's independent of the uh, uh, of your data, because even if there is no, even if there is nothing that you can pinpoint, no sample that is going to actually allow you 
to break it down into small pieces in a uniform way. Even if that doesn't exist, you can still index it. Now, the idea of filtering, I like to put this up because when my daughters were little, they had this game. So uh, this game is, there are two sides of the, you play it with another person. Uh, these are the, so some crime happened, took place. And, uh, and the criminal who did it was one of these people. So you actually write down which one of the people was the one who committed the crime, and the other person has to figure out who committed the crime. And they have an equal thing, but red, with uh, their people. Uh, it's, it's the same people, okay? So they have the same people, but they write who committed the crime, and you have to decide who committed the crime over there. So the way that the game is played, one side says, okay, so did the criminal wear a hat? And so if they tell you yes, you know that it's either this or this or that or that or, or that. So what they want the kids to do, you can lower all of these down and the set that remains are the ones that wear a hat. And then they ask their question and, and then you say, well, did the criminal have glasses? So if they say no, then you know that it's one of these two because they're the ones who have hat and glasses and so on. So this is the filtering method, in, in fact. And my daughters, when they had this game, they got it when they were four or something. And so I told them, listen, let me teach you when you play with your friends how you can always win the game. And they said, really? How? How? So their eyes light up. Ah, we can play with the friends and always win the game. So I told them, you do a binary search. What does it mean, binary search? So look for some property that about half of the people have. Don't look for a property that only one has. So don't ask, for example, was the person uh, bald and had glasses? Because there's only one person who was bald and had glasses, and it's true that if that's the case, it's something that children tend to do, because they see, ah, if that's the person, then I'm going to win in the first shot. But what's the probability that that's the person that was chosen? It's, it's not high. So therefore, uh, I told them, don't do that. Look instead and see what is a property that more or less half of them have and half of them don't? And ask if they had that property, and at that point, you lower half of them. And then next, ask, what's the, look at what you have left, and for a property that half of them have, and lower them, and so on. So I told them, what you get is binary search. In logarithmic time, you're guaranteed to win. And although, in the best case, it's not going to work, because if you're really lucky, then if your friend somehow stumbled upon the, the combination, because they can even say combination. Was it a, a redhead who uh, wears glasses and a green shirt or something? I mean, you can do any of these combinations. So maybe they locked out, and they happened to hit on the right combination. But in general, I told them, you're going to play more than one or two or three games. For sure, you're going to come out the winner. So that's how they learned um, binary search. So I recommend it. None of you have, has children yet, but uh, someday in the future, you have to start them young with algorithms. <laughs> and then none of them so far became a computer scientist, so I don't know. But uh, I still have hope with one left. And there's the granddaughter. Maybe she will be a computer scientist. <laughs> So there's always hope for future generations. All right. So the question was, uh, so, in the, so we can, music and faces are very complex relationships. And we don't really um, index them in a worst case kind of way, but rather it, it's probabilistically fast. The question is, what is it about the texts that made it easy. That in fact, we could, uh, we built the suffix tree and we can index a text. That's, and that became it. So what was it about it? What? So, let's look at other relations that have efficient indexing. Because the one that we, well, we saw one was the text, but there are others that are known to have efficient indexing. 
And uh, the first one is parameterized matching. Now, parameterized matching we saw, so I don't need to introduce it to you. Uh, that was Baker's uh, uh, paper from 1994. Her motivation was copying code, but there is efficient indexing for parameterized matching. We didn't see the efficient indexing, but we saw how that thing actually is very much like uh, KMP. And, uh, and somehow, uh, you can look at Baker's algorithm, or there are actually uh, others that are simpler that came later, uh, but it's indexable, and uh, you can probably even figure out yourself fairly easily how to do it. So that was uh, parameterized matching, and we can index it. And the indexing is similar. It's a suffix tree in some sense that you uh, construct, but a parameterized suffix tree. And then in 2013, so until 2013, all we had was these two um, matchings that can be indexable. And then in 2013, Kubica and friends, and um, independently Kim and friends, came up with what is called order-preserving matching. The motivation here was finding graphs that have the same relative ordering. Like, for example, music. If you have... Uh, if you have a music that goes a certain way up and down, but what you have is the volume, and sometimes the uh, crescendo in this case is a lot louder, and in the other case it's less. But it's kind of the same. Uh, but it's uh, but it's it's really the same, just different levels. But the relative ordering is the same. Or for example, if you want to see how the stock market moves, so when it goes up, when it goes down is what uh, you're concerned with, if it goes a little bit more, a little bit less, it doesn't matter. Uh, so that's called order-preserving matching, where you're looking for a pattern that goes up and down in the same order as the text, not necessarily, uh, ex not necessarily equal. So that same year, in 2013, it was already indexed. And so they actually constructed a suffix tree for uh, order preserving matching uh, into Maxime Korsmore and, and friends. So, uh, what does it mean? So, order preserving matching, you have, so we say that two strings, S and T, over alphabet N, uh, match in an order preserving way if their sorting permutations are the same. So, 117, 1613. If you sorted it, you get 2, 1, 4, 3. And anything that that would be the sorting permutation is going to be considered uh, an order preserved matching. In particular, 2, 1, 4, 3 matches 117,630. So from all of this, what we're going to do is we're going to be tempted to say, OK. Now, all this music and uh, faces and all of that is like real tough stuff. I mean, we saw that uh, even for doing rotations, we couldn't do it in linear time. Our time was O of n squared m cubed, and that was just rotation. If you're looking at a face in general, there's much more than just rotation there. There's going to be the rotation. There's going to be scaling. There's going to be the local errors. In other words, the... Um, so the uh, resolution differences. And in fact, there's going to be something else as well if you're looking at faces. Because here you're also going to have some sort of uh, affine transformations. Because if you take a picture of someone from this angle or that angle, even if, the, oh, even if the size is the same and everything is the same, it hasn't been rotated. There was an affine transformation there, not a rotation per se. So yes. If just the rotation was n squared m cubed, you put all these things together, and yeah, there's, it's unlikely that there's really a linear time algorithm that can do all of that. So uh, we're not that surprised that we can't match, that we can't index. However, for exact matching, we have the KMP algorithm that we saw. Very, very, very linear time. And uh, for parameterized matching, we saw an algorithm that was not very, 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 but it was just linear time. Why? Because for fixed alphabets, we showed the lower bound. If the alphabet is uh, infinite, it's not really 
linear time, but let's, but it's simple enough that for uh, fixed alphabets, yes, it's linear. Now the order preserved matching, all of these guys, Kubitska and Kim, their teams, the, uh, the papers that they, uh, that they wrote in 2013, showing that order preserved matching is linear time. And so yes, they're also linear time. And then Baker showed that parameterized matching is, uh, uh, is indexable, and Koshmor so showed that order preserved matching is indexable. But the bottom line is that these are all simple linear time algorithms for at least for, uh, for, for matching, for pattern matching. Okay, so we have two problems that we looked at. Module A that we looked at was the pattern matching. So in that module, the pattern matching part is simple and linear time. And now we come to module B, the indexing. So yes, so we're able to efficiently index it. So maybe that's what we're looking for. Anything that is simple and pattern matchable in linear time is going to be indexable efficiently. So that's what we're tempted to say. And temptation can lead to a whole lot of sins because, uh, it, because what happens? What happens is we got a challenge. So in 2005, it seems like only yesterday, but I remember Gadi Landau and I were walking sedately in Palermo and uh, he said to me, you know, we should be looking at histogram indexing. And I said to him, Shuada histogram indexing, which in Arabic means, what, what is it? Histogram indexing, so I will show you in a minute. But since then, it has become a very, very, very uh, research topic and appeared under many names like jumbled indexing or parik indexing. So uh, it, a lot of people are dealing with it because it blossomed into a huge problem that a lot of people uh, uh, think about. But this was, no one yet knew what it was 2005, and we're in Palermo, and Gadi told me that. And in fact, Palermo, in some sense, there's something distinguishing in Palermo that is a bit reminiscent of Ahmedabad. Because uh, um, the first time I remember that uh, we came to Sicily, so um, I rented a car in, uh, in Milan, actually, and we drove all through Italy, and then we drove through the entire boot all the way down to the tip, because Italy is like a boot kicking a ball, and the ball is Sicily. So there's a narrow sea between the tip of the boot of Italy and the island of Sicily. So and we drove all the way down, and then we wanted to take a ferry and cross the and cross the sea and go to uh, Sicily and then drive around in Sicily. And that's where we also went to Palermo. So that's the first time I was in Palermo. Now, when we rented the car in Milan, they, we rented the car with insurance. I mean, you drive, you want insurance. And they said, fine, but you only have insurance on land, not on waters, if you take a ferry. I said, but listen, you're renting me a car in Milan, and I'm returning it in Palermo because we flew from Palermo to Israel. Do you know any way of getting from Milan to Palermo without crossing water? I mean, Sicily is an island. There is no bridge. It's too big. Uh, can I get there somewhere? Do you know something I don't? They said, no, you can't. So I said, how are you renting me the car and telling me you're not giving me insurance? They said, no, 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 no. When you get to the ferry, you can buy an insurance for the crossing for the car. So if the car drowns, in the, uh, in the ferry company will insure it. We don't insure it. I said, okay, fine. So uh, we drove down all the way down, and we're, it's a long drive. Italy is long, and you're driving, and we're singing, and happy, and all of that. And we get there, and we buy the ferry tickets, and we try to explain to them that we want insurance. Now, these guys know Italian. They don't know English. This is southern Italy. This is not Rome, for goodness sake. Why would anybody there know English? So they don't know English. Now, we know Spanish, so we tried the word for insurance in Spanish. Nothing doing. They look at us as if we're talking Hindu to them. So um, 
So we found someone actually who knew English and uh, Italian and explained, and they say they, they never heard of anything like insurance. The boats don't sink. You go on the boat, you come out on the other side. So we had no choice. We went on the boat. We came out on the other side. It didn't sink. So we didn't have the insurance. But the insurance is not what reminded me of Ahmedabad because I, I'm sure that you can buy car insurance in Ahmedabad. That was not the point. You can't in Sicily, but you can there. But that was not the point. The point is, I came out on the other side, and we were driving out. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, siesta is very important there. 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the roads were pretty empty. But the roads are empty, fine, and I, but I don't want to get into trouble anyway. So I drive. There's a red light. I stop. The light turns to green. I keep going. Then there's a red light again at some point. I stop. And there's a car behind me, and he honks. Meaning, go. There's a red light. What do you want me to do? So in disgust, he uh, goes around me and he travels through. And I said, wow, where is the police when you need them? So I keep driving. And then it got to be a little bit later in the afternoon. So I stop in another red light. And now there is a police car behind me. And he honks to go in the red and I said, what? And he passes me in disgust and goes in the red light. And I said, ah, OK. I understand the rules. Red means go. <laughs> but OK, so I saw the same thing happening in Ahmedabad. That's the, uh, that's the moral of the story. But there is a difference. Because over there, the, uh, they did go through, but they looked to see that there are no cars coming from the cross street. In Ahmedabad, they don't. So everybody just goes into the intersection. It doesn't matter what the color is on the thing. Everybody just goes into the intersection. So when I was there on Friday, the hotel was very nice, Lemon Tree Hotel. And I went looking for the synagogue. So I go out to the street, and I see, whoa, you have somebody passing by with a camel. And then you have the rickshaws and the motorcycles and the cars and the people and no sidewalks. And everything is just helter-skelter in the road, and it's in the old part, so the whole street was from here to there. It's not like a big street. You don't know what side the cars drive on, because in Israel they drive on the right. Here, supposedly, they drive on the left. There they drive wherever there's space. So right, left, center. So all of that is going on, and I'm standing, and I'm saying, okay, now, if I were an American, I would be standing here now for a week and not be able to go out into the street. But I saw the idea, the general idea. So the general idea is you walk in and you start walking and let the cars and everyone sort themselves around you. So that's what I did, but felt still a bit uncomfortable in some sense. I said, OK, I'm putting my life here in the hands of all these strangers to uh, actually not want to dirty their car with blood. And that's why they shouldn't hit me or something. It's, there's an uneasy feeling. But then I came to a big intersection. And there was even a pedestrian light with a little red man standing and the little green man walking and that kind of thing. I said, ah, this street should be easy to cross. No, because there was no stop in traffic at any time. The whole thing was going on at the same time. So you had to do the same thing. You walk in, and then whoever passes, they pass, they pass, they pass, and you walk to the other side. So, uh, so Ahmedabad is better than Sicily in that sense because there is much more liveliness in the crossing of the red light. In Sicily, it was kind of tame. Yeah, you cross the red, line if the red light if there are no cars. But if there are cars, they didn't do it. So, uh, but I am telling you that it, it, was a, it was a nice experience. I really, uh, I mean, you uh, go through life and you want these experiences. They're good because, uh, because they make for fond memories. Sometimes these experiences, at the time, your pulse is a little higher than normal. But afterwards, when you tell the story, they're definitely great. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So, uh, so this is histogram indexing. And, uh, and I heard about it for the first time in 2005 in Sicily, in Palermo. What is histogram indexing? So here's the matching relation definition. We're going to say that S matches T if the length of S is equal to the length of T. That's the first thing. And if for all 
alphabet symbols, the number of occurrences of the alphabet symbol in S is equal to the number of occurrences of the alphabet symbol in T. And that's why it's called histogram indexing, because in some sense, take your pattern and do a histogram of the pattern. A histogram is exactly counting how many times every pattern element occurs. So if your pattern is uh, if your pattern is A, 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 B, B, A, B, C, C, A, C, C, B, so you're going to say, okay, what's the histogram? I have A, I have B, I have C, I have D, and A appears one, two, three, four, five times, and B appears one, two, three, four times, C appears one, two, three, four times, and there is no D, okay? So if there was a D in the alphabet, it's zero times. So this would be your, uh, so this would be your um, histogram. So that's called the histogram of a uh, string. And histogram is used uh, in a lot of places. It's used in text processing, it's used in images, and some, uh, someone even already 10 or 15 years ago already, they had a, an image indexing uh, idea that more or less used the histogram. They said, look at the color histogram of a picture, and any picture that has a similar color histogram, that's going to be your filter. So for example, if your picture is a uh, sunset, so you're going to have a lot of reds and yellows and oranges and... Uh, so pictures who have a lot of reds and yellows and oranges are going to be filtered by that. And so obviously a lot of sunsets are going to be there. Maybe some other things also. Maybe also if you uh, uh, were at, the, uh, at some modern art museum and there was a picture that has lots of red and yellow and oranges and has nothing to do with the sunset, but it would still be there. Or if you have uh, flower fields or whatever. But the point is it's a filter. So the idea of histogram is quite a common idea. So, uh, ah, okay, so here it's even uh, written well. So if we look at all of these strings, these strings from our point of view, from uh, uh, winner's point of view, exact matching point of view, these th strings are nothing like each other. But this is their histogram. In all of them, there are three A's, three B's, two C's, and one D. And so they all match from a histogram point of view. Okay, so the question that we ask ourselves is, assuming a fixed finite alphabet, this matching, is it a linear time matching or not a linear time matching? Well, the answer is, it's very, very linear time matching if you're uh, using a fixed alphabet because just use a sliding window and update the histogram table as you go along. This is a, also a great programming uh, exercise, it, it really is good. So, uh, so suppose that here is where you're, uh, suppose that this was the window and you counted the histogram for this window. As you slide it along, then you just delete the leftmost symbol from the table, you add the rightmost symbol to the table, and you get your next histogram. So there is your table. You know what is the table that you're shooting for. And so as you delete and build, delete and build, delete and, and build, you're going to get closer and closer or farther and farther from uh, your own table. But when you're there, you say, ah, match. Okay, so then we compare table to pattern. Again, if we're looking for a fixed alphabet, this comparison is a constant time comparison. If it's not a fixed alphabet, then you have some logarithmic thing there that you need to look at. Okay, so this is very linear time. In fact, it's so linear time that um, I think that if you ask your students in the programming class to program in linear time a exact matching algorithm like KMP or like the or like the witness table without giving them the algorithm 
not many would come up with a linear time algorithm. And not many is maybe being generous. So uh, on the other hand, if you tell them build a linear time algorithm for this, I would assume that many can come up with a linear time algorithm. So in that sense, at least from the sociological sense, uh, the histogram matching is, as a matching problem, is simpler than the KMP problem. And if our uh, measure for uh, efficient indexing is how simple it is to do the pattern matching, then it should be very simple. But, surprise, surprise, unfortunately, it's not. Um, now, when I say it's not, well, it started out by the fact that people tried to index it, thinking people m meant even me. Uh, after Gadi told me that problem, we sat there trying to index it. And so you can easily construct a data structure in time and space over n squared. I mean, that don't, you don't need to talk about. We didn't publish anything about it because there was nothing to publish. That's the obvious thing to do. So simply, for every index in i, for, for every index i in t, go all the way to the end and calculate the histogram for the segment ij. And as you calculate that histogram, add ij to the list of the appropriate histograms. So you put all the histograms, let's say, in a try. So every histogram that you calculate, go to the try and update the link to it. And so what is the time? Obviously, as you go from i all the way to the end, you add 1, it's O of 1, O of 1, O of 1. And the different ij's give you O of n squared. So it's O of n squared checks that you need to do. And for every check in O of 1, you actually can uh, go to the appropriate histogram and, uh, and, and index it. So it's easy to do, taking care of all the little details, it's very easy to see an O of n squared algorithm for it. And then once you have that uh, algorithm, when someone comes to you with a histogram, all you need to do is go to that histogram and it tells you right away what are all the places where that histogram appears. And so the time is going to be O of the length of the histogram plus TOCC. So the query is a fast query like we want, but the time and space are O of n squared, quadratic. And like we said, quadratic time is bad. It's really bad. I mean, quadratic, uh, uh, not quadratic time, quadratic space. The quadratic space of the entire uh, internet is not something that you can handle. So this is obviously not efficient. So the question was, can we do any better than this? That's the trivial question. And what is the trivial thing that you always do whenever that's the case? You say, all right, let's do binary alphabets. And as I told you, that's the difference between AI and theoretical computer science. Because in AI, when there is a complex problem, they look at it and they say, wow, let's generalize. And, uh, and in theoretical computer science, we say, let's simplify. Let's look at uh, the easiest alphabet we can have, which is a binary alphabet. Now, in fact, when it comes to alphabets, there's really two sides to the coin. Binary alphabet is very easy, but the other side is uh, um, a permutation. In other words, an alphabet that doesn't repeat, where you have the symbols 1 through n, and, but it's a permutation of them, and a lot of problems have uh, very simple answers in permutations. As you saw yourself, if you want to do pat pattern matching with mismatches, and uh, if it's a permutation, we can do it in time O of n, which we can't do in linear time, because all you need to do for the permutation is remember that algorithm that you go on the text and the number that you have, you uh, you say, okay, I am number five, so uh, denote a match at index five from here. I am number seven, denote a match at index seven from here, and so on. So in big O of n time, you can run through and denote all the matches. And so any place that has m matches, there was a uh, there was a, uh, a permutation in that particular case because. Uh, they all matched. Not a permutation, I'm sorry, but uh, the pattern appeared there. 
because they all matched. The important thing here is that it was the, the same appropriate location. So we don't need um, smart algorithms with FFTs in order to count matches in a, if my alphabet is 1 through n, I can do, the, uh, I can do that easily. But on the other hand, um, on binary alphabets, we can't do it in linear time. So these are the two sides of easy alphabets. Uh, but in pattern matching, since we are looking at big numbers and we're generally then not considering permutations, therefore, uh, binary alphabets is the easy case. So let's consider a binary alphabet. So we assume, and let's also assume a decision problem. So in other words, I want, I have a binary alphabet text. I want to pre-process it in a way that when you give me a histogram of zeros and ones, how many ones, how many zeros, then I can tell you if there is a sequence with that number of ones and that number of zeros, or if there isn't. But I can't point to it. So this is the simplest uh, problem that we can find derived from the problem that we don't know how to do. Okay, so we went to that. And then, so we found out that there's an important property here. If you consider the number, you only have zeros and ones, right? So the segment, let's say, is of length m, then there are l ones in the segment. So, sorry. Okay, so the number of ones in the segment is going to be l in our case. So the segment is of length m, there are l ones, which means that uh, the number of zeros is m minus l. Okay, so uh, the claim that we're going to make is that if l max is the maximum number of ones, no, sorry, so l is the length of the segment. Rewind, l is the length of our segment. And let's fix it for the time being. So if l max is the maximum number of ones, that you have in any segment of length L. And if L minim is the minimum number of ones that you have in any segment of length L, so if you go through the entire text, fixing L, going like a sliding window, and counting in how many segments of length L, how many ones do I have in the first segment, the second segment, the third, the fourth, and so on, and the smallest number of ones that you have in any segment is L min, the largest number of ones that you have in any segment is L max. So the claim is that for any number len that is greater than L min and less than L max, there exists a uh, length L segment with exactly len ones. So that's the claim. So if it's enough to actually record the smallest and the biggest number, and then you know that in the string you have everything in between. Why? Because you can't really jump from any L length segment to a number bigger than two of ones, a number of ones bigger than two, because if you slide it, how can you rise by two? Something has to go out and something has to go in. If what went out was a one and what went in was a one, your number of ones didn't change. If what went out was a one and what in, went in was a zero, then you, were, then you went down, you were reduced by one. And if what went out was a zero, and what went in was a one, then you're increased by one. But by one shift, you can never move more than one. So if you need to get from the minimum to the maximum, the only way you can do it is one at a time. And if you do it one at a time, it means that at some point along the way, there were L length segments with every number in between them because you couldn't have skipped anything. So, this gives us a nice algorithm for what we want. Okay, so that explains what we said, because if you slide your window, as you slide it either to the right or the left, you can only either increase by one or decrease by one. So when you need to get from the min to the max, <coughs> you have to go through all of them. So, but that gives us our algorithm. So let's construct a table. The size of the table is going to be O of n, because we're going to put for every length the maximum number of ones and the minimum number of ones. And now, if you have a query of length L, 
So you get a histogram. The length of the histogram is L, and they say we want to know whether 10 ones and L minus 10 zeros exist somewhere. So go to L and see what's the minimum and what's the maximum. And if your number of ones is between the minimum and the maximum, then you say it exists. And if it's not, you say it doesn't exist. So your query time is O of 1, and your space is O of N, and the only question is, how long does it take to construct this table? So the table is of length n, but I need to construct it. So obviously, if you fix an L, you can do it in time O of n. But since there are n Ls, that gives you the O of n squared. So scratching, scratching, scratching. And it turns out that uh, the, so the space is O of n, the time is constant. But the time to construct the database by all, all kinds of four Russian tricks, the best known is O of n squared over poly log n. And in fact, lately, I, I think there's even a result that shows that you can do it in n to the 2 minus some constant, uh, some tiny constant. So it's not just n squared over poly log n. But any way you look at it, it's very, very close to n squared. And that is pretty bad because uh, close to uh, quadratic time is not what we mean when we say something is done fast. Uh, and not certainly the way that we defined efficient indexing. So you needed not just the space to be constant, you need, uh, to be linear or O tilde of n, but you needed the time to be that. Okay. So then, now we come to the uh, now we come to the O star, because so uh, uh, Kochimaka, Radojevsky, and Reiter in 2013 actually said, okay, let's trade off, let's see if we allow a bigger um, if we allow a higher than linear uh, power. To the search in this particular case, they uh, it's m to the some constant times delta. But then you can reduce the database space by this delta, so it's going to be n to the two minus delta. So in some sense, uh, you can go as close to one as you want by going as close to uh, to two as you want. Uh, a quadratic as you want for the uh, search. This is, yes, for a general algorithm. Now, I'm not going to show you that paper, but let me show you a flavor. But let me show you a flavor of why this kind of thing should work and what is involved. Why would you think that there is such a trade off? So let's look at something very simple. Let's assume that uh, what I want, I, I allow quadratic time, and I just want the preprocessing to be O to the uh, O of n to the one and a half rather than O of n squared. So I'm giving an idea here of why the trade-off should work. So what does it mean O to uh, O of n to the one and a half? So let's say that uh, for every pattern or for every uh, sequence of length less than or equal to the square root of n, uh, construct a table. Okay, so that's very easy because in linear time we're going to go through length one and build all the histograms. Then we go through length two and we build all the histograms, and length three and we build all the histograms. And since the time is O of n for every histogram, and we're looking at the lengths up to square root of n, so our time and space for the table. Yeah. 
is O of N uh, times square root of N, which is O of N to the one and a half. Okay, so here's our pre-processing. But now, why can we do the query fast? All right, so any query that you have whose length is less than square root of n, go to the table and find out, and you uh, got your answer in time O of m, in fact. So the query uh, for um, patterns of length less than or equal to square root of n, go to table, and the answer in, oh, well, it's not even O of m, because if we're talking about uh, a fixed alphabet, your answer is going to be, well, yeah, O of m, because you need to find the histogram. Okay, in O of m. If you get it by the histogram, it's going to be faster. If you don't get the histogram, but just the pattern, you have to compute it. So in O of m, you can do it, which is fine, because uh, that still is uh, our definition of efficient indexing. But what happens if your length is greater than or equal to square root of n? Square root of n. So your length is equal than that. You don't have a table. What do you do? Well, then go through the uh, go through the text and look for it and look for the histogram. How long does it take you? It's going to take you n times m, right? But m is the size of n in this case because uh, uh, it's um, so it's really O of m squared. No, sorry. M is actually square root of n, right? So if, you are, if your time is going to be running through the text, um, uh, square, so uh, do the old trick of cutting the text into uh, two times square root of m things. So your time is going to be O of, o of m squared uh, for every one of these of these pieces of size square root of n, you multiply it by everything. So your time, your general time is still O of m squared. Square root of m times square root of m is m for each one of the pieces, and you have m over square root of m pieces. So the time is O of m squared. So that gives us the that gives us this trade-off, which in some sense says, okay, if we allow here a polynomial, then we can play with the space and reduce it, which is not our definition of efficient. We still don't know if this is efficient. So it gives some sort of a, um, an idea of what's going on there. So now I want to look at a different kind of, uh, of matching. This matching is going to be block mass matching. And uh, it comes from the motivation is tandem mass spectrometry. Okay, so what you see here is a mass spectrometer, and all of these have to do with tandem mass spe spectrometry. And uh, this is more or less reminiscent of the uh, story that I told you about that uh, meeting in Padova in, 1960, in 1996, where everybody put in the beautiful pictures from biology. So this is a beautiful picture from biology because tandem mass spectrometry, you can like show them, ah, here, this is a mass spectrometer. Now, why it has to do with the problem, I don't know. But Pavel Pevsner came to me in uh, 2010 and says, listen, I have this problem in, in uh, tandem mass spectrometry. And he explained to me what the problem was. And I said to him, can you tell me combinatorially what it is that you're trying to do? So he explained it to me combinatorially. And so I will explain it to you also combinatorially and you will see what the black mass, uh, the block mass matching problem is. But trust Pavel, it has to do with something real. So um, let's move on.
So we, are, we want the thing combinatorially, and combinatorially means you fall asleep, t equals t1 through tn, p equals p1 through pn. That's what we want. And this is the definition. So you have t, well, t0 to tn in order to be a bit more uh, risque. So uh, t is equal to t0 to tn, and ti is the mass of the ith element. So here's the mass coming in. So ti is the mass of the ith element. In some sense, you're taking your DNA and you're looking at the mass of every one of the bases. So the mass of, or if you're looking at a protein, you're looking at every one of these um, uh, constituent uh, parts. So this is the mass of the ith element. And uh, so therefore, our alphabet is really the natural numbers. And then we have a pattern, P0 to PM, where PI represents the mass of the ith consecutive block. So what it is, is, is it's hard for them to actually sequence things and find things, but it's easier to look at uh, like a mass of a block. So what he says is, so you have, we really, at least when we're doing the searches or something, so what we have is we really have the text, which is a whole bunch of numbers. And then the pattern is also a whole bunch of numbers. But what I want to do is find all the places where the sum of all the masses is equal to P0, followed by the places where the sum of all the masses is P1, etc., etc. So I think there's a picture here, yes. So we want to find all the locations in I, where the prefix of T starting at location I. You know, why does... Uh, why does it, I mean, why does PowerPoint do this? So this I, it's not a capital I, it's a small I, right? And it, whoops, and it changes it by itself. And uh, there's, it's really, there's no call for this. No? It's a different keyboard. Uh, okay. Okay, it's a small I. Let me change. Did you see what just happened? <laughs> okay. No. All right, let's uh, run back to where we were. You know, when machines decide to do things on their own, this is the, uh, it's good for all kinds of horror science fiction flicks, but it's not good for light. So we want to find other locations I in the text where the prefix starting at location I is composed of sequences S0 to SM, where the total masses of the sequences is P0 is the mass of sequence S0, P1 is S1, etc. So in this example, Suppose this is the text, and your pattern is 11, 13, 5, and 19. So here, 2 plus 2 plus 7 is 11. Then it's followed by 13. And then it's followed by 5. And then it's followed by 19. So this is the location that we're looking for. No, no. They don't have to be of the same length. They have to have that their sum equals the sum of the pattern. So the pattern is just the uh, list of sums of these adjacent sequ uh, of these contiguous sequences. So that's the problem. The sums, yes, yes, yes. It's in the order of the patterns. No, this is a different problem. It's not the histogram indexing problem. We took a break from that. So this is a different problem. The sums here are uh, in this order, and the sequences are contiguous. So there's the first sequence, followed by the second, followed by the third. So as you can see, when you look at it combinatorially, well, he came to the right place, because it's the kind of thing that we deal with, but it isn't any matching that we had done before. So uh, this is the kind of thing that in pattern matching we love, is when someone comes from the real world with some sort of a new matching relation, that we've never seen before, 
And so, yeah, I mean, we can, out of the blue, define all kinds of bizarre matching relations also, but who cares? So he comes in uh, with these pictures of the, uh, of the machines and of the arrows and all of that, and it becomes all of a sudden very respectable. So, so here's a respectable problem. So how do we do it? Now, in fact, uh, solving this problem, you know how to do it. So this was easy. I mean, this didn't take more than a couple of minutes to think. But the problem was the, uh, the indexing part. But this was easy. Why? And I know it's the 10th day, and everybody's tired. So, And not only that, we are like rapidly approaching the end where the lights slowly dim, and it's like uh, Haydn's go Goodbye Symphony. So, uh, so you don't have to think. Uh, let's tell you. Now, okay, of course. So the naive is O of n squared time. I told you that uh, the first thing one always does is think of the naive algorithm. The naive is O of n squared. No, we don't want to do that. So the idea that to make it faster is going to reduce the one-dimensional, uh, reduce to the one-dimensional point set matching problem. So what's the point set matching problem? The point set matching is really the following. <coughs> Suppose your text is points in the plane, and your pattern is points in the plane. And your question is, is there a translation of this pattern that actually matches, a, matches the text? In other words, in this particular case, wow. See, so these points actually match this point set in the text. So this problem if we translate it into one dimension, it is going to be we have a text, that we have points in the text, and we have a pattern. And we're asking whether the pattern matches the points in this text. And uh, if you look at it, ah, we have a match. Houston, we have a match. So uh, the question is, do you know how to do that? OK, let's start with the easy case. Let's say that uh, these are zeros and these are ones. So the circles are ones, the non-circles are zeros. And I want you to tell me whether you can find all the points that, and then you have the pattern. And I want you to tell me if you can find all the locations where there is a point set matching. The pattern is also ones are the circles and zeros are the non-circles. So can you tell me fast where are all the point set matching locations? Of course you can, because you're going to do an FFT. Um, well, oh, before we go here, you're going to do an FFT. And what's the FFT that you're going to do? You're going to say, uh, you're going to take the binary string on top. You're going to take the um, you're going to take this string, and you're going to multiply them. When is there a point set matching? Whenever. So what does the uh, uh, convolution do? The convolution do a dot product. So what's the dot product going to give? Whenever there's a circle in the pattern and a circle in the text, it's going to count it as a match. If there is either no circle in the pattern, like here, and a circle in the text. Or if there is no circle in the text and a circle in the pattern, like it doesn't happen here because there is a match, then you would not count it. So in short, what it is that we count? We count all the circles in the pattern that matches circles in the text. And what do we want? We want all the circles in the pattern to have a matching circle in the text. So. If our pattern has four circles, do the convolution. The time is n log m. And then run through. And every place where the answer is four, you accept. There is a point set matching. And if the answer is less than four, there's no point set matching. Right? Everyone's with me on this one? That's right. I just want the, the ones to match. So there shouldn't be anyone in the pattern without a friend. 
I don't care what happens with the text, but the pattern, they should all have friends. So we multiply, and we just know how many friends there are. But if every pattern element needs a friend, then the number of pattern elements is what the result should be. And everywhere where it is, the points match. So again, if you think about uh, this particular problem, then what does it mean? I mean, I don't care if there are points all over the place. I want these points to match. And the same thing here, when you're looking at uh, the uh, one dimension, you want these points to match in the one dimension. You move it along, and everywhere where these points match, I don't care what's in between from the text. Good. So, how, what is the reduction we're going to do? So let's, again, let's assume that we have uh, some uh, uh, fixed alphabet here. Um, because that's what we do when we have mass spectrometry. So let's write every element, k, in unary notation. Because the alphabet is fixed, we can allow ourselves to do that. So the element k in unary is going to be 1 with k minus 1 zeros in the back. Follow. OK, so in the example, this text, 237322277332323723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723723
the number of ones in the text is small. There's only small n number of ones and only a small m number of ones in the pattern. So in some sense, it is like our uh, point set matching that we have, but these points are sparse. So to go and fill in the entire space with zeros is ridiculous. So you're going to put a one in uh, Gandhinagar and the one in uh, Mumbai and every meter of the way you put a zero, there's a lot of zeros that you need to put in. You don't want to do that. So you do want to use convolutions, but you don't want the time to be O of big N times log big M. You would really want the time to still be O of big N, uh, small N times log of small N. And the question is, can we do that? And the answer is yes. And this, uh, and this um, technique is called length reduction. So the idea is you map the text and the pattern that are very large. You map them to a small text and pattern. You have some sort of a hash function where you hash the text and the pattern to a small text and pattern. And, um, and again, because this is very large, but the numbers of ones is not very large, it's going to be OK. You hash. You expect not to have clashes. So you do the fast transform on the small text and pattern. So you do your convolution, smack, 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 and the answer comes out here. And that should be O of small n log small m. Now you map the result from the transform resulting to the original text and pattern. So you had that h, the hashing function, into the small things. You got the small result. You hash minus one, I mean, you, you, uh, you go back to the original text, and that's your uh, solution. So the goal is that given two vectors, v1 and v2, you want to obtain two vectors, v1 prime and v2 prime, whose size is n prime, that is the smaller size, such that all the non-zeros in v1 and v2 will appear as singletons in the hash. So again, because there is not a large number of ones, so you expect that there should be ideas of doing it. And you also want to maintain some sort of a distance property. In other words, because you want the ones to be equidistant, then you want when you map the ones for that distance to kind of keep. So the distance of 5 in the pattern, whatever it is that you matched in the text should also be the equivalent of the distance of 5 in the text, or the distance of 100, should be the equivalent of a distance of 100. Because at the end, when you get the matches, you have to keep these distances intact. In in so formally, this definition of uh, what's the distance property is written here. But let's not get too much into it, because we're not going to go into the details of the hash function either. So uh, using the reduced size vectors, you can then match in time O of n prime log n prime using the FFT algorithm. So that would be the idea. And so the vectors, let's look at an example. The vectors would be given as sets of pairs. So V1 is going to be these pairs because it's really very long. But in index 0, I have a 5. Then in index 6, I have a 2. In index 13, I have a 3. In index 19, I have a 1. So, and maybe this thing is like 30 long. So all I have is really five ones, four ones. And uh, there's 30 long uh, text, so I really don't want the, the multiplication to, to be of 30 length. And then the pattern has in index 0, it has a 2, and in index 3, it has a uh, 7. Uh, sorry, and in index 7, it has a 3. In index 0, it has a 2, and in index 7, it has a 3. So in fact, if we look at it, we see that as far as the uh, distance here is concerned, so if I match the 2 here, the distance of 5 here, so the 3 here, that, that would be a match. Here would be a match of the 2 and the 3. That would be a, a point set match. Now, what we could do is, this is not what's done, but it's uh, brought in as an example to exemplify what's happening. So suppose what your hash function is going to be the index mod 5. So in fact, the v prime is going to be 52031. 
because you take the index mod 5 and that's where you stick every one of them by taking the index and modulo 5. So now your entire text is a lot smaller. It's actually of length 5 rather than being length 30. And the pattern also since we're looking at mod 5 is 20300. 0, 0. So in fact when you want to match the 203 it's going to match here. And then you need to recover that into the original indices. But at this point what you actually mapped and in and in fact, if, there were, if these zeros were not even here because the pattern was small, then you would have ended here. So your time is going to be 5 log 3 as opposed to 30 log 30 or something. Okay? So, in stock 2002, Richard Cole and Ramesh Hariaran, uh, which is why I told you that if you wanted to also join, there would be things that he could teach <laughs> easily. Uh, they found a set, so they gave a randomized algorithm. They found a set of log n short vectors in which with high probability each non-zero v appears as a singleton in at least one of the vectors. So there's a high probability there that these vectors are, uh, and the hash function that they used is ax mod q mod, mod s where Q is a large prime number and S is O of N. So between the two of them together, they got the properties that you want, and they showed that uh, uh, if S is uh, C times N, the probability of a non-zero appearing as a multiple is constant, which means that if you run it a large constant number of times, you're going to get as small as uh, you want, so your zeros are going to be so your clashes in the hash are going to be basically uh, inexistent if you run it a reasonable number of times. So using log n different hash functions reduces the failure probability exponentially and therefore they can actually uh, do it in randomized uh, um, O of n log squared n time. So in O of n log squared n randomized time they can do this <clears throat> point set matching, which in our case means that even if you want to do for an infinite alphabet, if you wanted to do a uh, block mass uh, indexing, which uh, when I told this to Pavel, he looked at me with great disgust and says, who has an infinite alphabet? What are you talking about? Why do you need this? So uh, the, <laughs> the finite alphabet is fine. <laughs> But, you know, uh, all of a sudden uh, we, uh, we get excited. Ah, so now we know how to do it with a finite alphabet. Let's move up. Let's be AI. Let's generalize. Infinite alphabet. Okay. So we can do it randomized in time O of n log squared n. Now, just for completeness, with uh, Eli Poat and uh, Oren Kapach, both were former PhD students of mine, uh, we actually showed that... We can do it not randomized, but in fact deterministically with an O of n squared preprocessing and a running time O of n log squared n. So the running time is the same as the, uh, as the running time of the randomized algorithm. The preprocessing here is longer. However, the idea is that if you want, that if you're going to actually do this kind of uh, block mass indexing, then your text is going to be there. So it's okay if you pre-process, then you're going to have lots and lots and lots of, uh, uh, of queries coming up. So run all night in time O of n squared, and then you can get your, uh, uh, your results for every query in deterministic uh, time n log squared n. But all of that, of course, is a stupid thing to say because who's going to run all night? Nobody has an uh, infinite alphabet. So, <laughs> but, so there's this also. Which, by the way, means that, again, can that algorithm be de-randomized? Can the pre-processing be done in little o of n squared time and yet give the randomized running time for the queries that, uh, that the uh, Cole and Harry uh, algorithm gives? Okay, so uh, we're the, the challenge was that when we look at the indexing of this problem, it turns out to be difficult. It turns out to be very difficult. So let's consider the special case. 
where the pattern has length one. So what does that mean? So remember, the, what caused all the uh, ruckus in the block mass indexing was the fact that you had these consecutive blocks. So let's simplify, simplify, simplify. Say you don't have consecutive blocks. You just want to look for one block. In other words, I, you have a text of numbers. I want you to pre-process it. And then when I give you a, uh, a number, you tell me, is there a sequence that sums up to the number you gave me? If you add them all up, that's the number you get. So naive, of course, you can pre-process the text in time O of n squared, and then have query O1. Naive is, no, is, not, is not what we're doing, not at this point, not in the 10th day. We're not naive anymore. We're very sophisticated. So, uh, so the problem is, ah, and here it didn't turn the small eye to big eye. Ah, look at that. So you have to find all the locations I in the text where the segment of T starting at location I has total sum P. Okay, the simpler version, the pattern of length one. So if P is equal to 11 in this example, then this, there are two places where we find it because 2 plus 2 plus 7 is 11, and also 9 plus 2 is 11. So 3 plus 3 plus 2 plus 3. OK. So these are the locations that we want to find. OK. So um, again, beautiful algorithm for you to give your uh, programming class. I mean, this is going to come up very useful for the programming class. A simple algorithm is, let's consider the prefix sum array of s. So in other words, take s and look at all the prefix sums. So s of 1, uh, s, uh, sorry, so the prefix sum, let's say s prime, is going to be the first number of s, the sum of the first two, the sum of the first three, the sum of the first four, etc. Now, the query is going to be, you have a left pointer and a right pointer, and you move them along, and what you want to do is, subtract the right the left pointer from the right pointer if the if you subtracted and the number was p that's your query then you found it if the difference is greater than p then you're going to advance the left pointer because the prefix sums are going to you're going to get a larger number on the left so if you subtract maybe that's equal to p so you advance the left pointer if the difference is less than p you're going to advance the right pointer in this way, these pointers are going to run all the way to the end, and, uh, and you're going to find what it is that you're doing. So let's see the example. If the text is 232, two, this is the text that we had before, that remember the, the phone number, but the prefix sums is going to be 2, 2 plus 3 is 5, 2 plus 3 plus 2 is 7, 2 plus 3 plus 2 plus 7 is 14, etc. So these numbers are the sum of everything up to here. For each location. And if p is equal to 8, then you start with your pointers. The left pointer is on the left, the right pointer is on the right, and the distance between them, 5 minus 2 is 3. Since 3 is small, so we say, well, let's advance to the right in order to see if we can get to 8. So we move this pointer and subtract, and it's 5, still small. So we move here, and it's 12. Oh, that's too big, so forget it. We cannot start at 2, so let's move it over. And now the difference is 9, it's still too big, so let's move it over. 7 is too small, so we move it over here. 10, 10 is too big, so we move that one. 3 is too small, move here. 6 is too small, bingo! So we found, uh, so we found our 3 plus 3 plus 2, which is equal to 8. Okay, so the time here is obviously linear because you never go back. We've seen that concept before. If your pointers only go to the right, and every time a pointer moves to the right, so the two pointers are going to get from one side to the other in two n times at, at most, it's not going to take more than that. If we stayed at one point, we're in trouble. As long as you keep moving, that's what I heard about sharks. The sharks have to keep moving all the time. So you have to be a shark in this thing. As long as you keep moving, you're linear time. Ah, you'll see why we need the prefix array. Yes, you can do it with a regular sliding window. 
But I want the prefix array because later on I'm going to show another problem that's going to do the same kind of thing. And so the prefix array is going to make it be exactly the same. Okay. So, um, for a, you obviously can add and subtract and add and subtract. Yes, it will be the same. But the prefix array is there. We'll see why. So for a fixed finite alphabet, uh, where the largest number is C, let's consider the decision problem. Is there a substring whose sum is P? Okay, so again, now we're moving on to indexing here. And we're going to show that there actually is an efficient indexing scheme for this. Um, uh, Neil, I'm already well into the third hour. It's fine for me to just go all the way through till noon. And then we end up with uh, tearful goodbyes. So, or do people feel like there's a need for a half hour break? If not, I don't mind just uh, rushing headlong into danger here. Okay, so we'll continue. All of you people in the live streaming also, we're continuing all the way. <laughs> all the multitudes, <laughs> all the <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people that are watching in live streaming. But, you know, for them it's easy because they can actually go over to the, uh, to the coffee machine, make themselves tea or something or coffee, sit down and sip the coffee and watch the thing. It's, they can even make popcorn and, and eat the popcorn while they're watching the movie. For the live streaming, it's easier. It's us here who are suffering because, uh, I don't know, I didn't tell you not to, but uh, some people feel like they can't take out the popcorn and start crunching. Crunch, 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 crunch. Oh, wow. Whoa, yeah, look at that. Look at that algorithm. <laughs> it could be interesting. <laughs> it's, uh, it reminds me that uh, we were in uh, Holland, and we went to some museum. I don't remember which one it was. But um, it was an art museum. And we were walking and looking at the uh, pictures. And art museum, you know how art museums are. Uh, it's, they're quiet places. And people are walking like this and contemplating the pieces, and possibly in a hushed tone. One says, look at this and look at that. Wow, the artist. And then they move on to the next. And it's all these sedate people talking. It's a quiet and a very respectful place. And as we're watching something, all of a sudden, we hear excited cries in American English, of course. But shouts, shouts. Oh, my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. So everybody in the university turns around, and you see two teenage girls jumping. My god, I can't believe it. Look at this. Look at this. It was the famous picture of the girl with the pearl earring. And so uh, there was a movie, and these girls saw the movie, and then they saw the uh, picture <laughs> of uh, the Vermeer famous picture of the girl with the famous earring. And they got so excited. And, but it was amazing to see that uh, all the people in the uh, in the museum, of course, when, when the shouts, you saw all the heads turn of all these sedate people, everybody's head turning, and with a frown, I mean, who is shouting and who is yelling? And then when they saw these girls jumping up and down, you saw how it was almost simultaneous. Everyone, like, smiled and said, you know what? Let them jump and get excited about Vermeer rather than jumping and getting excited about some stupid pop uh, a concert or something. So, wow. I mean, that's okay. It makes us happy. So, I, so that's what I'm saying. If you guys would be sitting here with the popcorn and saying, wow, look at that algorithm. Woo, we did it in linear time. I would say, okay. <laughs> okay, we did it. We have the right attitude. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, I am hoping that some people out there in the live streaming are doing that because they don't feel any inhibitions. And they can actually say, that's such a great algorithm. <laughs> but uh, it only happened to me once in class, in the entire years I was teaching. I don't know. I finished. It, it actually was the dueling algorithm. And when I finished the dueling algorithm and I said, OK, so as you see, whoever is alive now from the fire stage and then the tsunami and whoever is alive, that is an occurrence of the text. And then all of a sudden, the whole class applauded. They applauded for the algorithm. I felt so good. So, um, 
So uh, it's okay. I mean, I think that every once in a while, showing excitement about algorithms is, is not a bad thing. Maybe that's why they even invented that fun with algorithms conference. Uh, you, it's, it's, uh, they, it can be fun. Let me tell you another thing, since this is the last class. And uh, so about 20 years ago, there was a big, um, there was a big immigration from former Soviet Union to Israel. So many Jews, when once those, all the doors opened and they could finally leave the uh, ex-Soviet Union, they all came to Israel very happily. So those years, I had in my class many, many, many uh, students from the Russian uh, immigration. So these guys, one day we had, uh, I, I don't even know what was the context, but because in Israel the students are more interactive, uh, so um, uh, we spoke about something which is irrelevant in Gujarat, this being a dry state. But uh, they somehow think that vodka is a good drink. And I told them there's nothing good about vodka. Because, oh yeah, it burns, but uh, you may as well drink gasoline if you just want burn. Gasoline at least has some taste. Vodka has no taste, so it just burns going down. So if you want something that's 100 proof and has a taste, so you should have Arak. So Arak has a number of names. Uh, Arak is the name that uh, we call it in uh, Turkey. But in, uh, in Greece, they call it Uzo. Uh, in America, they have a weak version of it called Aniset. It's weak because it's like 17 proof or something. But the Arak is 100 proof. And it, uh, and it has the taste of anise, the plant, which is a taste that some people like, some people don't. But it certainly has a taste. So if you like licorice uh, candies, that's the taste. So, uh, so I said, look, a rock is a lot more, is a lot superior. So, okay, so the class goes on. Last class of the semester, there were still some things that I needed to finish. I come into class all eager to finish what I need to finish. And what do I see? I come into class, balloons everywhere. And they put in uh, cakes and candies and uh, sweets and all kinds of things like that. And on my desk, there was a bottle of Arak and a bottle of vodka and glasses. And every student who came, in, who came in had to choose one of them and do cheers and uh, do a lechaim. Because the idea was to uh, test out what is really more popular, the Arak or the, or the vodka. Now, you're probably eager to know who won. Well, I can tell you that at the end of the class, the Arak bottle was totally empty. The vodka bottle still had a little bit in it, so the Iraq won, of course. Now, I don't know the exact reason, because the problem is that. How can you teach in this kind of environment? With the fumes of Iraq and uh, vodka all through the class, everyone already had making a cheer, and some people making more than one. And all the balloons, and all the and people really eating the cakes and the munchies, and so there's crunching and uh, this are going all over the place. It was kind of hard to teach, uh, as you can imagine. But on the other hand, it was a class. And I, so I figured, OK, you know what? Let's like ask general questions about the material, things that you particularly didn't understand all throughout, because there's going to be a test. Now, again, this is irrelevant to us, uh, not, not, not relevant to this class. But there was going to be a test, so if you have questions, so fine. So people were asking questions in this lively environment. And as they were asking questions, I was uh, answering them and sipping from uh, a rock because, of course, I did my cheers on the rock. The thing is, these Russian guys, they were sneaky. And every time that my glass was finished, they would run and refill it with the rock. So this went on throughout the entire class. So it could be that that's the reason why the rock bottle finished. I cannot uh, guarantee anything. I was in no state to make guarantees. So I was, so I gave that class. Now, something else interesting happened in that class, and is that they, um, they said, listen, Professor Amir, to tell you the truth, there were some jokes and some stories and stuff like that going on in the class, and it wasn't bad at all. It was good. It helped us, it helped things sink, and 
but what's not fair is that none of that appears in the exam. So, having imbibed a lot of Iraq, I said to them, you know what? I'll give a question in the exam, a five-point question, about the uh, material that was not math and not computer science, about the uh, stories and whatever, something. That is going to be actually a multiple choice uh, answer to make it easy, five points. But I wanted to forestall anybody who would say, because there's always someone like that, they would say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, I know that I am really humor challenged. I cannot understand the joke. People tell a joke five times and explain it to me, and I still don't understand what's funny. So therefore, it is not right that I should uh, lose five points on the joke question because I don't understand jokes, but this is not a joke class. If I went to a joke class, it would be right, but this is a computer science class. Why should I lose five points in computer science? Because I don't understand jokes. So I said, that is a valid point. And that's why the five points is going to be five extra points. So in short, if you know your computer science 100%, you get 100, you finish the course with 100, wonderful. If you only know your computer science 95% and you answer this question, you're going to get 100 anyway because you got these five points. It's like a bonus. So, you know, five points. I, I, was, going to, I was willing to take a risk with that. I didn't think that, uh, that it really matters much because really, how, how can you value within 5% the knowledge of someone? I don't know how to do it anyway. So I said, I'm willing to take that risk. Good. And it turned out, you'd be amazed. I mean, you would think. That's what I thought. I, I thought that everybody would get that question right. I mean, if I asked you now about some algorithm that I taught five days ago, you may or may not remember all the details. But if I ask you about a joke that I told five days ago, you'll know it right away. So I thought that this should not be a problem. But maybe with five days, it's not a problem. With the whole semester, it is. I don't know what it was. But less than 10% got that answer right. And it was a big class. I mean, the, those were the big years. And I had three sections. And so there were about 500, 600 students taking that exam. 10% only got the Joe question right. So it's a big sample. It's a sample. It's a meaningful sample. Uh, so it was surprising. The amazing thing was that somehow, this became a tradition. So in that course, it was uh, algorithms too. In that course, every last class, there would be balloons, there would be food, there would be sometimes arak and sometimes not. The vodka, they realize, is uh, not necessary. But they would bring other drinks like Coke and uh, whatever. And, uh, and, there was, and there would be a joke question, making it up to 105, everything. And it was perfect year after year for a number of years. Uh, the same 9%, 10% got the joke question right, which was uh, surprising me again and again. But that's what happened. Then all of a sudden, one year, as I'm grading the exam, one question in the entire huge class got, got it wrong. Everyone got the joke question right. And one poor person, I don't got it wrong. So there's one, one, only a single one. That's really way past the probabilities. Uh, that cannot be explained. So I grabbed some student and I said, look, you've got to explain to me what happened here. This is not what happens every year. So he burst out laughing. He says, well, don't you know, there's this student, and uh, he even named her, and she actually wrote down all the jokes and posted it on the internet. So uh, he didn't bother, but we figured for five points it's worth it. So we reviewed the jokes and the stories, and, uh, and we, uh, we all got it right. So I said, okay, 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 okay. Now, this is defeating the purpose, because the idea of the joke question is not that you study my jokes. Because if you want jokes, and I do that, I, I give them always at the start of a class, I always give them the best joke book that there is, it's not going to help you much, but uh, because it's in Hebrew. But the name is Droyanov, that's the author. And it's called Otsar uh, Abdichav Achidud. 
if anyone out in the streaming knows Hebrew, then I recommend this. It's like a treasury of uh, witticisms and, uh, and jokes. And as far as Jewish jokes go, it's an amazing book because these jokes are sophisticated. Uh, some of these jokes, anyone who doesn't know the Talmud is not going to even find funny. And if you know the Talmud, you think it's hilarious. So it's an extremely sophisticated joke book. And so that is part of the uh, bibliography of the class. And that's for the jokes. I say, good. So you read Joranov. It's three volumes, well annotated and documented because he actually writes the origins of every joke, if he knows it, how far back, how many hundreds of years, etc. Who told it to him? And um, and I even found, uh, and I even found there, which is in a, a different story, but uh, I even found there are some things that in uh, Korea appear in the, what they call the Talmud, the Korean Talmud. So some of the stories that they think came from the Talmud actually came from there. Uh, I helped my daughter in her research on that thing, and that's since I know Droyanov. I said, no, this is not from the Talmud. This story is a pure Dryanov. So, um, so I tell them, this is not the point. The point is not my jokes. The point is, uh, is uh, real jokes. So I said, no, I'm not going to give any more joke questions because that's really not the point. And in retaliation, they stopped with the parties. So we became a normal, Algorithms too became a normal class for about seven or eight years. And then, all of a sudden, one year, there was a student whose older sister took the course years before, and she told him the story. And so he told everyone else. And I came in in the last class, and there was the party ready, so they did get a uh, joke question. And since then, it's like a hit or miss. If a class gives a party, they get a joke question. If they don't give a party, they don't get a joke question. OK, so um, this was all for the streaming people. Um, so our problem is we have a fixed finite alphabet. The largest number is C. And our decision problem is, is there a substring whose sum is P? And so let's see a sufficient, a, an efficient indexing scheme. So again, let's look at the prefix sum array. And, and here we need it. So that's why uh, I used it for there also. So let's look at the prefix sum array. The largest entry in the prefix sum is going to be NC. Why? Because C is the largest alphabet symbol. And if C is the one that appears in all text locations, if, if the whole text is just the largest number, then the largest sum is going to be NC. So that is going to be your largest. Uh... And so NC, as far as we're concerned, is O of N because C is uh, fixed. And so therefore, here's what we're going to do. When we pre-process, we're going to construct a bit vector whose length is NC. That's really O of N. And bit I is going to be set if and only if there's a prefix whose sum is I. So this is what, what we're going to construct. So in O of n time, we can obviously uh, uh, construct this thing in uh, pre-process this thing. And uh, the thing is, because you, you just turn the bits on, go run through the uh, prefix sum array and uh, go through the bit vector. And just as you uh, continue, just light the appropriate bit in the prefix sum array. Now, what does a query mean? on this uh, prefix sum array. So a query just means if we, have b, if we have two bits, i and j, that are both set, if i plus p is equal to j, then you have a p in the, then you have a p in, this, in, the, in the original array. But how do we implement the query? So the pre-processing of the text we saw is O of n. But how do we implement, implement the query? Again, we go back to our beloved convolutions. Because the FFT helps us here. Because what does it mean 
that bits i and j are set where uh, i plus j is equal to, where i plus p is equal to j. It, me it means that if we're going to shift b itself, p places, p positions to the right, then there will be two ones that coincide. So we're going to have two coinciding ones if there is actually a p like that. So here we are. We shift it, in this case, three to the right, and we have the, the, both of these coinciding. What it actually means is that we have this index and this index, that the difference between them is three, and this index and that index, that the difference between them is three, and the difference between them means the sum, because this is exactly, so when we subtract one from the other, we get exactly the sum. So in this particular case, what we know is that there are at least two positions, not just, we don't just know if it exists or not, but we know how many positions throughout the text we have that whose distance is, is three. But as we know, what does it mean? What's the meaning of uh, shifting it three and, uh, and, and we see that in two places they meet? It means that you do a self-convolution of this uh, array. You take the B, pad it up with zeros all the way to the end, and then you do a convolution of it with itself. So at location K, the number that is written in location K is going to be the dot product of the Kth shift. So any, so if you get a P, just go to position P in the result of the convolution. And the number that's written there is the number of uh, places in the text that sum up to p, because that's j minus i. So the convolution gives us exactly what we want. In other words, uh, the pre-processing is going to be n log n, because we do the self-convolution. So n log n is the pre-processing. And then when you have a query, in time O of 1, you answer. You don't get all the indices that you don't get but you do get how many times there was such a match so again our convolutions that we love came to our rescue so uh, yeah this is uh, something you really don't need but it actually shows what the convolution does it uh, it does the dot product of the shift and put it in the array so this is what a convolution is and the fast Fourier transform gives us exactly that so we build the convolution vector, and for a query p, we check if the pth entry in the convolution is 0, then there's no sum, and if it's x, then the number of occurrences of substrings of some p is x. Okay, so now comes a small exercise, not that I'm assigning, but that we're going to do together. What if the block mass matching problem, instead of being a substring of some p, we wanted a substring whose product is p. So same question. Do I have a definition here? No, that's not the definition. So same question as we had before. But you have a text. The text is all kinds of numbers. The pattern is a big number. And you want to tell, and I want you to tell me for every location what uh, um, not for every location, for every uh, number that I give you in the input, are there any locations where if I multiply all the numbers in the text, I get what you wanted? So that's my question. And the answer that you're giving me is the one that's here. Are you kidding? It's exactly the same problem. There's not a no different problem. I mean, take the exact same algorithm that we had before. This was the algorithm. Consider the prefix sum, but instead of prefix sum, call it the prefix product array, and then change the algorithm wherever it says query p, use exactly the same algorithm, but everywhere where it says difference, write quotient, same algorithm, bam. Not only the same complexity, but the same algorithm. You just change the arithmetic operation, and the arithmetic operation, we, in, our, in the RAM that we have been talking about so much, all arithmetic operations are O of 1. 
So what difference does it make? You take the algorithm, plug in this arithmetic operation, plug in that arithmetic operation. Same algorithm, same problem. Okay, fine, fine. I say, all right, relax, relax. I didn't mean to be so divisive, but uh, I just asked the small question. So if it's the same problem, is indexing the same? That's like a natural uh, continuation. We have the same problem. Is the indexing the same? Well, you're going to say, uh, okay, let's see how we solved it. We have the convolutions array. But what did the convolutions array did? It actually did the dot product and then added them. But here it's going to do a dot product and multiply and uh, rather than adding. So this is not what the convolution does. What you want is to do the dot product and multiply. Ah, doesn't work. Okay, fine, but then why don't we use the logarithms of the numbers? Because if you uh, multiply two numbers, it's like adding, their log uh, like adding their logs. So if I want the product to be equal to my thing, then let the sum of the logarithms equal to the log of the pattern. So com convert everything to logarithms, and uh, your pattern converted to a log also. And now we have the same problem as before, really. So why shouldn't it work? Well, it should work except for one thing. What is the resolution? Okay, because when you're looking at logarithms, so these things are long. So how long do they need to be? And in fact, if we're going to need n bits for the logarithm representation, then our time is going to become quadratic. It's only going to work if the log representation is sufficient with... Uh, log n bits, and maybe it is. I mean, the FFT itself. Okay, so let me say something else. Uh, this is as good a time as any to say it. In fact, almost anything I want to say now is as good a time as any to say anything I want to say to you. But, uh, okay, so the initial Fisher-Patterson algorithm that I've been saying, that I've been using and saying to you all the time, okay, we do a convolution, it's n log m. Well, it's n log m word operations again, because the Fisher-Patterson paper did it on uh, Turing machines, and so they looked at bit operations, and it wasn't n log m, it's n log m log log m, in order to do the FFT if you want to do it bit operation, so it's not really n log m. The reason that we do it in n log m is because we don't look at the bits, and we assume that, all our, that our words are of size log n, and we assume that we can do log n, uh, arithmetic operations in time O of 1, so the time becomes n log m, since we're working on a RAM. We don't work on a Turing machine. So I wanted to work on a Turing machine, and I ordered one, and they're still working on the infinite tape, so I didn't get it. So uh, we're working on a RAM instead. The problem is, that, uh, so how do we know in the RAM uh, that the algorithm works? Because remember, not, not even in the RAM, I would say, even in the bit, uh, even in the bit model, the, there's a question if this thing works. Because remember how we did the uh, FFT? We actually translated, we went to the complex field, and we went to roots of unity, and all of these things are there. These roots of unity could have ra non -rational, irrational numbers in them also, as we uh, do that math. So how do we know that... Uh, the math actually gives us the right result within the resolution of log n. So this question actually even appeared in Knuth. And so the question was a question that was looked at, and it's an important one. But the answer is, all these numerical analysts people, they prove that log n resolution is enough there for the FFT. So we actually can run our FFT. The log n per word resolution is good enough, and we get the correct result. We can use the FFT. Everything's wonderful. But here... We need a similar kind of proof. Are n bits good enough? Are log n bits good enough, or do we need n bits? Because if the log representation for our problem is more than log n, maybe even if it's square root of n, it's already not going to be the uh, time, the n log m time we want. So it's going to then have n square root of something. Uh, so that's the question. And it could be even quadratic if it's n bits. So surprise, surprise. Histogram indexing, 
over a fixed finite alphabet is the same as product indexing. Why is it the same? Because what does histogram indexing mean? Histogram indexing actually says, let's have, um, let's have all the locations that have this particular histogram. Now, if we're talking about a fixed finite alphabet, then let's replace the alphabet symbol by the first C prime numbers. Everything is fixed, so we don't care here about the size. We're not going to get something that is more than constant in any event. We have a constant C. Look at the first C prime numbers. But what happens with prime numbers? Because of prime number decomposition, so the histogram can be represented by the product of all the prime numbers. So in fact, what you want is exactly, if you're indexing for the histogram with these fixed final alphabet, what you want is to index for the product. It's the same thing. The histogram is going to be the same as the product. These are prime numbers. The same number of prime numbers is the, what's in the histogram. So it's exactly the same problem. And therefore, we could do histogram indexing if we did know how to do our, our product indexing. And we think that we should be able to do product indexing. Well, life is not easy because it doesn't work. So in a 2014 paper we, with Timothy Chan and Moshe and Noah Lewinstein, we uh, proved that under a three-sum hardness assumption, Histogram indexing for an alphabet of fixed finite size is going to require O of n squared minus epsilon pre-processing time or O of n to the 1 minus delta query time for any epsilon and delta greater than 0, which means that any way you look at it, you're not going to be able to get something that is, um, that is constant, uh, um, that is efficiently indexable. So you can't really efficiently index the problem. But under what is called the three-sum problem. So what's the three-sum problem? What we're looking at now is what is called conditional lower bounds. Conditional lower bounds say, OK, I may not be able to prove a lower bound. I can't prove to you that, in fact, this thing is not indexable. But I can prove to you that if it is indexable, then some problem that we think is a hard problem, uh, not proven, because if we prove it's a hard problem, then we have a reduction. But we think it's a hard problem, uh, will become easy. And since the belief is that this is a hard problem, then I'm now in the same conditional uh, complexity as that problem. In some sense, you know this concept, because if you think about uh, NP, NP is exactly this. We don't really know that NP is not equal to P. We believe that NP is not equal to P, but we don't know it. So if we ever prove that it's not, then all of a sudden, all these NP hard problems, we know that they're hard. But if it is, then they're not. So what is the point in knowing that a problem is NP hard? It's because it puts it in a class that we don't know what it is, but if one of these guys is going to be proven that the entire class is hard, and then we know that our problem is hard. The same thing applies in complexity, but also in lower levels. And in this particular question, the three-sum problem is a famous problem that is not considered to be able to be solvable in time significantly less than n squared over polylog. So it's kind of bounded by, uh, by a quadratic time. And what's the three-sum problem? It actually has a lot of versions, and for the various uh, reductions, people use the different versions whenever they help them. But the most simple version is the following. You have a set of natural numbers. That's what you're given. So your input is a bunch of numbers. And you have to decide whether in that set there are three numbers A, B, C, such that A plus B equals C. That's what you need to do. And you need to do this in time significantly less than quadratic. So people know how to do it in quadratic time. And there is a big uh, industry of actually squeezing it a little bit faster, a little bit faster, a little bit faster. But the conjecture is that eventually, no, it's kind of quadratic. You cannot squeeze it too much. 
there's so much you can get out of a dry uh, threesome. So uh, you can't squeeze it too much, and that's the conjecture. And the point is that if, indeed, the, um, uh, we can do efficient indexing in the way that we define for histogram, then three sum can be solved faster than O of n squared uh, over poly log. So that is highly unlikely. So people think it's highly unlikely that, uh, uh, that it can be solved. However, uh, from a philosophical point of view, you see something very interesting, that, for the, uh, that somehow the time complexity for the pattern matching problem doesn't really, is not what tells you about whether something is efficiently indexing, indexable or not, because we looked at two problems. We looked them in the whites of their eyes. The uh, sum, the block mass indexing, which is the sum, and the product, which we said that as far as pattern matching are exactly identical. So we cannot distinguish them as a pattern matching problem. And we showed that one of them is indexable efficiently, and one of them is indexable only if uh, the three-sum problem is easy, which we don't think so. So there is a conditional separation between the two of them. So either something very revolutionary can happen and that we show that they also are in indexable uh, efficiently. Maybe somehow use numerical analysis techniques and prove that the logarithm, uh, that the log, um, uh, the, that the length of the logarithms that you need for uh, doing the product uh, um, problem is actually small and therefore you can do it, uh, it's efficiently indexable, and all of a sudden you get a fast solution to three sum, and it's a really, really big and revolutionary result. Or you've shown a separation, and what that means is that you really, really, really still don't know what is efficiently indexable and what isn't. The lower bound? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, so we proved it for a fixed size alphabet as well, but I think that the smallest it was proven for was an alphabet of size 4 or something. So yes, there's also a possibility of trying to squeeze it down more. But it's true even for a fixed alphabet, not just for a general alphabet. So the lower bound definitely dealt with a fixed alphabet. The original paper was a bigger alphabet, and then there was a subsequent paper by Chen and Leonstein that squeezed it down further, but no, it's, uh, it's definitely true even for a fixed alphabet. What I showed you here is more or less now this very, very recent. So there's a lot here that hasn't been done yet. Uh, so we didn't play with trade-offs and that sort of thing. Yes. Yes, all that. That's also possible. The advantage of being in a new area is that there's so much going on that even if you do things in a coarse way, you've got something that people are amazed, but then there's a lot to do if you want to fine-tune it. So the, uh, the puzzling conclusion is that the substring sum and substring product matching problem are identical from a, complexical point, from a complexity point of view when you're looking at the matching problem. But when you're looking at the indexing problem, we have separation of the indexing complexity, but at least, let's say, conditional uh, separation between them. So that's, that in itself is puzzling any way you look at it, uh, whether it's, they're the same or not. Uh, so of course, we don't understand indexing. And there's a lot of open things. Some of them we just spoke about. But I think that the big, the, the, the holy grail here, the, the big problem that 
one should be uh, searching for is to find necessary and sufficient conditions that on a relation that imply efficient indexing. In other words, you, when Pavel Pevsner came to me with his relation, he shouldn't come to me. He just takes his relation, he goes over to, the, uh, to this paper, this uh, hypothetical paper, and he checks whether his relation satisfies these conditions. And if it does, he has an efficient indexing. He doesn't need anybody else. And not only that, better yet, that uh, paper, in fact, comes with a little package that uh, he even builds it for him. He says, OK, so put in the, uh, so just put in the modules of your matching and this and that, and smack. Here is now your efficient indexing algorithm. So that is where you want to be. But failing that, let's look not for necessary and sufficient, just for sufficient conditions. So we, we're working towards it. In fact, one of my current PhD students just wrote a paper about a set of uh, very general sufficient conditions that allow indexing and plus the algorithm so in some sense, he shows that all of these pattern matching that we know are indexable are subsets. So all the papers that people wrote to show that you can index parameterized matching and index the uh, uh, order matching and index, uh, and index the and winner's algorithm and all of these things, plus some other relation that uh, is an interesting one that comes out of it. It's like if you want to do matching on a tree even. So you have a tree that's given, and the match would be if you have a path on the tree that matches your pattern. So he can index for that also uh, because it has these kinds of uh, conditions. So, so he has a bunch of fairly general conditions that allow him to index. Um, but they're not entirely maximal. We think that we have a... Maximal in the sense that if you throw away any of them, we have a counterexample that can't be indexed. So uh, that we don't have. And we do have a set of maximals, uh, uh, a maximal set of conditions that we think is also sufficient, but we don't quite have an algorithm that ties it all up all the way, so that we're working on. But that's a direction that we're making small steps to get to the big direction that you want to be. I mean, if you have general enough sufficient conditions, that can help also. Because Pavel may say, well, I don't know necessary and sufficient, but at least I come up with something where these sufficient conditions are good enough. So it can help some. And it certainly helps in the sense that you can take five papers that appear, then they actually all follow from a single result. So you didn't need five papers. Just Each one of them should just say, look, this and this and this condition are met. It's indexable. Don't need to do anything else. OK, so and there are a lot of less monumental problems there. Uh, weighted indexing, um, indexing with don't cares, approximate indexing, indexing with swaps. Uh, we mentioned a whole bunch of other things here. Working on the, on the trade-offs. Uh, what can we, how low can we push alphabets? All kinds of things like that. So there's really lots and lots and lots of uh, open problems coming out of this entire indexing thing. But to summarize in a crude fashion, is efficient indexing a rare f phenomenon? In other words, is this the index finger, or is it another type of finger that for the uh, honor of this crowd, I didn't want to actually bring a picture of? So that would be indexing. Now, we still have about nine minutes. So let me start just for a taste of one last thing, and that's interchange matching, because that's it's nothing that we have done so far, but there's a lot of work that had been done in it. Nah, don't say it. Ah, maybe I should have said it. It's that I. <laughs> OK. OK, so interchange. Now, there was a lot of work that was done in this idea of uh, asynchronous matching. 
So the motivation is the same motivation. People are going to say, well, you have a text and you have a pattern and we'll fall asleep. So that's the motivation for everything that we start. However, here is what's different from that picture. Because in the old days, old days, is the, the last 10 days being the old days, when we were talking about pattern matching, the pattern and the text are given in the correct sequential order. This is exactly why people fell asleep, because they heard. Here is the text, T0 to Tn. Here is the pattern, P0 through Pn. And then what you're asking is the content, the, the content is wrong, the matching is different, you index, you do all these various kinds. You want to... Uh, so all these things are there, but there is something that's inviolate in your life, and that's the order of the world. Uh, one comes before two, and two comes before three, and three comes before four. But what about a new paradigm? Because it could be, okay, obviously the end is where nothing is sure. But uh, let's start by the opposite and say the content, the content didn't really change. Whatever was in the text or in the pattern, whatever it was, is, didn't change. But it's still not exact matching because the order of the pattern symbols may have been scrambled. Why? Because the pattern has been transmitted to you, for example. It had been transmitted asynchronously. So suppose you did some sort of a uh, streaming uh, of your pattern. The pattern is very long and it's, uh, uh, and it's uh, streamed and it's streamed in packets. So a packet of the pattern gets streamed and another and another and they get streamed through various uh, routers along the way. So it could be that Packet number three arrived before packet number two. And if there was an error in the index, then you're going to think that packet three is really packet two. And so now, all of a sudden, your order is scrambled. From a combinatorial point of view, um, what we're going to say is that the pattern symbols do not arrive at the way that they were transmitted. They have a different order, even if nothing was changed. Uh, it could also have to do with the nature of the uh, application that we're looking at, not just if it was transmitted asynchronously, but the application is such that it actually changes things. And here is that story that I told you, but there's no more time for stories, about, the, uh, about sometimes bits get stuck in uh, hardware or get changed or get flipped or things like that. And at that point, it could be that there is a stuck bit in your uh, address register. So all your addresses of the pattern, as they were transmitted, they all were changed because that stuck bit changed all ones to zeros, or every zero to one and one to zero. And so your question is, what do I do now? So there could be a lot of things that cause a, um, that cause a, um, an asynchronous or a change in the order of things. Now, in applications, we actually even know applications. We spoke about swaps. We mentioned them. And these kinds of uh, typing errors are really, really very common. You don't see them, obviously, in texts because the speller already would be read, and so people would change it. But when people send email to each other and they just type whatever they type and send, you really find a lot of these kinds of things that where a letter next to each other is swapped. So when we're looking for the pattern these, what we're seeking are the symbols of the pattern, but with an order that was changed by swap. It wasn't changed by a random kind of uh, change, but in this particular application, we're looking for something that is changed by swap. And uh, pattern matching with swaps, in some sense, is even easier than pattern matching with mismatches. It's a paper that uh, is going to be for some other time. Uh, Yes, so swaps like you here when you type. So you swap two adjacent things, and anything that was swapped can only be swapped once. On the other hand, there's also something called reversals, and it happens in, uh, in uh, it happens a lot in biology. So given a DNA substring, it could be that a piece detached and reversed, and so this is actually going to be equal to this with a single reversal. So GCC TTGA is now GCC TTGA here. It's it just reversed. So that's a single reversal. And that happens. And uh, so the question is, what's the minimum number of reversals that's necessary 
in order to match one uh, pattern to another. Now, in fact, the problem was looked at as permutations because initially this particular problem came from biology. And in biology, they didn't look at it as a DNA substring. They looked at it as a string of genes and the entire gene sequence detaches and converts. And since they felt in those days, although they know today that it's not quite true, that there's no repetition in the genes, so what you have really is a permutation. And so the problem was defined as what's the minimum number of reversals that are necessary to sort a permutation. So this is a problem that was actually quite uh, well researched and looked at at the time. Um, and in 1996, Berman and uh, Hannah Hanley called this global rearrangements as opposed to local rearrangements, which is edit distance. So they said this is global. And they showed that the problem is, in fact, NP-hard. But in the context that we're looking at now, it's not a question of global rearrangement or local rearrangement. It's a question of a error is in the address rather than error in the content. And it's a particular kind of address error that we have, where you take a substring and you reverse it. So that's what happens to these addresses. And this particular problem happens to be NP-hard. Then another example is transpositions is given a substring, can you take a piece and transpose it to somewhere else? So again, within a gene context is when they asked this, what's the minimum number of transpositions necessary to sort a permutation? So you take an entire uh, substring, in this particular case it's even a permutation, and you move it to somewhere else. You detach it from where it is, everything like joins together, and you plug it in somewhere else. And this particular problem, uh, Bafna, Pevsner, and Christie, and Hartman, they all showed that there are all kinds of polynomial approximations, although the last I know, and again, I didn't check this in a while, uh, it wasn't known if the problem is NP-hard or not. But they did find all kinds of good polynomial approximations for the problem. So it could be that by today it's known. I don't always follow the uh, computational biology literature, so I don't know that. But again, as far as we're concerned, it's another special case of address errors rather than content errors. And here is another interesting example, which is even baffling in some sense. Unlike the transpositions, which is not known if it's NP-hard or not, but it has only approximations, this one is called block interchanges. And what it means is that you take a block and another block and you exchange them. So transposition would be taking a block and an empty location and exchanging. But it somehow makes a difference because Christie proved in 1996 that in fact uh, the minimum number of block interchanges necessary to sort a permutation is quadratic. So yes, it's polynomial. We don't know if transposition is polynomial time. But I'm bringing this also only as an example of where we have a uh, where we have a problem with the uh, where we have a problem with addresses. So this summarizes what I said until now. When you're talking in biology, you're talking about sorting permutations. In pattern matching, we talk in we talk about pattern matching, not permutations necessarily, and. Uh, the sorting isn't so much the thing, but it's, we're not talking about permutations, but we're talking about matching. Uh, the big difference is the fact that things can uh, change, uh, that uh, letters can repeat. But another big difference is not just that letters can repeat, but the fact that we shift what we're looking for. Whereas when you sort a permutation, it's like saying, OK, is something of length m equal to something of length m? Remember, in pattern matching, we say, here's a long text. And for every position, for every uh, sub substring of length m, I'm asking if this is equal to the pattern. So these are two big differences. Nevertheless, all these things that the uh, biologists look at, like reversals, interchanges, and transpositions, which we don't know how fast can be done in the worst case, np-hard, o of n squared, 
uh, they were hard. Whereas for swaps, we showed in 2002 that we can actually do this in time O of n log m. And I'm talking about the matching with repeated things. Now, on the other hand, swaps are easier because in a swap, you really have a block interchange thing. But there are three simplifications. The block size is one. We only exchange a block once. We're not allowed to exchange a block and then part of it exchange it again. So once you swap, whatever was swapped is not swapped again. It came to its final resting place and that's where it stays. And these block interchanges are adjacent, which means that all of these three together give us something that's a lot faster and a lot uh, and more general in the alphabet sense and in the shift sense, etc. And what I thought I would have time to do, but I really don't, and not because I don't want to, but because I still need to go back, take a shower, or finish packing, that sort of thing. Since, as my daughter said, this trip has been a really work trip. I landed at 6.30 in the morning, 9 o'clock I taught. That was a two and a half hours between setting foot in uh, Ahmedabad and, uh, and coming here and uh, teaching. And now I have roughly the same time left between uh, when I finish and when I get on the cab and I leave. So it was packed from end to end. It was really a lot of fun. So if you want, the, this presentation is here. And basically what we did was we started chipping away at these restrictions and saying, what happens if you have a block interchange with restriction one and two, but not adjacent. In other words, you can swap things that are different. What happens if then you allow it to swap more than once? So all of these different things we uh, handle and we look at, and uh, there is like an edit operations map, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all kinds of definitions, swap matching things. There are really neat uh, uh, randomized algorithms using convolutions, where we use the short zipper lemma and all kinds of really neat stuff. So. Uh, you're welcome to, uh, to look at the uh, presentation because you will have it. Unfortunately, uh, you won't have me explaining it. Um, so uh, wh what does that mean? I don't know. Maybe it means I really need to come again. But uh, thank you all very much. It's, it's been nice. Thank you.